Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for being here, your attendance, whether in person or uh, virtually. Uh, we appreciate your attendance today. Um, and uh, we're going to get going here, and I'm going to start the... Um, well, first I want to say welcome to the Northern New Mexico uh, uh, Mexican Citizens Advisory Board, and we want to call this meeting to order. Uh, before I get going too far, we're going to have our IT folks uh, show us how to use the microphones that are in front of you. As Keith just demonstrated, the right button on the right side is push to talk, and you have to push to turn it off. It is directional, so please speak into it. Otherwise, zoom or let it come up. All right, thank you. Um, also, one more thing we want to do is uh, also discuss some of our staff changes. We have. Uh, we have a new staff member, Yolanda Valdez. Uh, she's going to take on the executive director position. Oh, sorry. Executive administrator position. You got a, you got a promotion their first time out. Uh, Bridget, uh, we all know Bridget. She's going to actually be our executive director now. And we all know Manice, and she will forever be our senior advisor. So uh, she says she's going to retire, but we're going to keep her as long as we can. So uh, that's all I have right now, and I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you, Keith, and welcome, everyone. And I want to say congratulations to Bridget, and welcome, Yolanda, and deepest thank you and appreciation to Manice for for guiding us for so long. So I, my name is Elena. I am the chair of the Northern New Mexico Citizens Advisory Board. Welcome. Um, we are, this is the January 31st, 2024 meeting, live from Santa Fe, New Mexico. We are on WebEx, and uh, our meeting is being recorded, and we will be posted on YouTube. YouTube, apologies. Um, we, the CAB, the Citizens Advisory Board, are comprised of citizens of New Mexico, from different backgrounds with different expertise, we are always recruiting for new members and the requirement is that you are not a DOE uh, employee, a federal employee, one of their contractors or subcontractors or an elected official. Essentially you as a New Mexican are a subject matter, matter expert and we value your diverse opinions um, and experiences and uh, advice. So we provide guidance and recommendations in an advisory role and are not an oversight entity. Um, the guidance, advice, and recommendations that we provide go to the DOE, Department of Energy, Office of Environmental Management for Legacy Waste at Los Alamos. And legacy waste is waste that was generated at Los Alamos National Laboratory dating from approximately July 1999, back to the beginning of the laboratory that includes Cold War and Manhattan era waste that currently resides at Lanel. Oh, apologies, you can be an elected official. That opens the door. Elected officials, please apply. We look forward to it. Um, and, and so, if you do apply, we as members serve the citizens of New Mexico from our perspectives, and we and our federal and state partners, we have uh, our environment department partners here today. Thank you for being here. Um, all, we all want the same thing, which is safe and transparent cleanup of legacy waste. And while we feel passionately about legacy waste remediation, in this meeting, we expect civility and respect of opinions, presentations, and discussions. We expect the civility and respect of one another and you, the public. One of the foundations of the site-specific advisory boards is to help build the public trust by bringing all of us together to discuss legacy operations at and from Los Alamos. So again, we are being recorded and our meeting will be posted to YouTube. And I always make this joke, if we go viral, you saw it here first. So now I would like to go around the room and the screen with introductions of our CAB members. And I will call your name as I see you on screen and in the room. So we will start with Anne. Good afternoon, Anne Laurent, um, Los Alamos County. I'm the deputy county manager, and I, I just take this opportunity to let you know that I'll be the county manager as of March 3rd, so I'm excited about that. Perfect. Congratulations, Anne. Okay, 
Next, let's go to Beverly. I'm Beverly Martin. I uh, retired from Lanel and um, I live in Santa Fe. Thank you, Beverly. Sterling? Hi, Sterling Grogan. I'm an ecologist. I live in Santa Fe. Thank you, Sterling. Manny? Manny Lesperance. I'm also retired from Lanel and living in Santa Fe County. <clears throat> Thank you, Manny. I'll let Chappie Jose has entered the building. Would you like to introduce yourself? Chappie, please push the button in front of you on the microphone. Buenas tardes. Whoa. <laughs> Buenas tardes de la Dios and good afternoon. My name is Jose Villegas Sr. And um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. We're glad to have you. Thank you. We'll let Mark settle in. Um, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Mark Hayden. I am general counsel for the Retirement Health Care Authority here in the state of New Mexico, and I've been on a cab for almost four years. Thank you, Mark. And who do we have online? Because. Melissa Casillas, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Melissa Casillas, and I'm from Taos, New Mexico. Great. Thank you, Melissa. And I see Marty. Yes, thank you. I'm Marty Hewlett at UNM Taos. I'm up here in Taos, New Mexico. Sorry I couldn't be there today with you in person. We're glad you're here. And, and Melissa, too. Um, who else is online? Steven. And Stephen McLaughlin, would you please introduce yourself? I'm Steve McLaughlin. I'm a retired attorney and businessman living in South Santa Fe. Great. Thank you, Stephen. And I see that our vice chair, Patricio Pacheco, is also online. Patricio, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patricio Pacheco, uh, representing uh, non -Ben New Mexico. I apologize. I couldn't be there in person today. I had some meetings I had to run. Great. Thank you, Patricio. I appreciate it. Um, before we move forward, I also would like to have a, a quick housekeeping. If you're online, please be sure to mute your phones or computers. Um, if you are in the room, please mute your same thing, phone, phones and computers. Um, if you are able to turn on your camera, if you're online, please do so because it's nice to see you. Now, let's see. Do we have any elected officials? Okay. So I'd like to introduce uh, Susan Col Coleman of the Hanford Citizens Advisory Board. She is joining us online today. Thank you, Susan. And Melanie Hand, who's the County Counselor of Los Alamos. And um, I believe that's all we have for now. Uh, if there are any members of the public in the room or online that would like to introduce themselves, this is your opportunity. Please do so. Okay. Okay. Did Tom? No, we're good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are going to, uh, for those of us in the room and members online, you should have all received a meeting packet with the agenda and presentation. I'm going to go over the agenda quickly. Um, so for everyone's information other than the agenda, this we talked about this last meeting in September. DOE headquarters has requested that meeting packets not be sent out to the general public prior to our meetings. They are, however, made available to members in the room and online just before the meeting. And we'll, be do, we'll do our best to make sure attendees are able to follow along. After the meeting, they're posted. And they will be posted to the website after the meeting for your, for your review. So I will go along the agenda. Uh, so we will have a, we had a call to order, welcome and introductions, overview and approval of agenda. At 1.10, we're a little behind now, we'll have old business, an update from the chair and vice chair, update from our subcommittee chairs, 1.20, new business, 1.30, update and look ahead from N3B, Brad Smith, president and general manager. Thank you for being here today, Brad. 
And then we'll have an update from the New Mexico Environment Department, and we have members of the Hazardous Waste Bureau present today. We have Ricardo Maestas, who is the Acting Hazardous Waste Bureau Chief. Thank you for being here, Ricardo. And Megan McLean, who is the Acting Waste Isolation Pilot Plant Program Manager for the Hazardous Waste Bureau. Thank you for being here today, Megan. And then at 2.30, we will have an update from, uh, from the Environmental Management Los Alamos Field Office, Michael McAlenis. Thank you, Michael. 3.15, a break. At 3.30, Kevin Reed will give us a presentation on landfill covers, their purpose and performance. And a hard stop at 4.15 for public comment. 4.30, we will review the 2024 meeting schedule and Northern New Mexico Citizens Advisory Board work plan. This is new for 2024. And at 5 o'clock, we'll see if we adjourn. All right. Do I have... Okay. So if everyone has had some time to read the agenda, if there are any, any modifications to the agenda that uh, need to be suggested, please state your name and say if you have any modifications to the agenda. If not, um, we would make a motion to approve. Are there any modifications to the agenda? So moved. To approve? Okay. Mark Hayden, second. Okay. Sterling, motions? Mark, seconds, thank you. Moving on, the agenda is, do we approve the agenda? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Great, all in favor. Agenda is approved. Okay, let's move on to old business. Um, I don't have any updates as the chair right now. Patricio, as vice chair, do you have any updates? Uh, I do not see any updates on my end, no. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to an update from the subcommittee. Please note that the subcommittees are where the work for the CAB is done. The Citizens Advisory Board, also known as the CAB, if you're new. Um, we, the subcommittees, announce ahead of time our meetings with an agenda. We are open to the public with time for public comment. Any work on recommendations are done in these meetings in view of the public for transparency. Um, so we also have the opportunity for the public to engage directly with the subcommittees. These are held typically via WebEx and include our deputy designated deputy federal official, DDFO, and our advisory board office. Mark, do you, does the consent order subcommittee have an update? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have met preliminarily on the new work plans for the 2024 year. We have not taken action on them yet, but we have discussions on how we'll approach those and have another report at the next meeting. Thank you, Mark. The public outreach, as I am chair of both the public outreach and risk evaluation and management subcommittee, we, um, our members have been sent the work plans as, as, uh, as sent to us from headquarters. And so we'll take some more time to review those and then we will meet to finalize those work plans or just discuss them. And uh, we will also vote on our new chair and vice chair for the both subcommittees that will be coming up. So we have not done that yet. So that's where those two subcommittees are at. And I believe as far as the public outreach subcommittee, the board is looking for a new, is working on a new website. And will that be, how is that? Is there an update on the website, Bridget? Nothing new from last time. Okay, so we will have a new website soon, and it'll be exciting because we'll have, um, it'll be a nice repository for all of our recommendations, past meetings, um, agendas, and site visits. So we look forward to that. Thank you. Let's move on to new business. I don't have any new business. Do any of our members Madam have any new business they'd like to introduce? Madam Chair. Yes, Stephen? Yes, um, I had previously submitted a motion uh, for consideration and new business at this meeting regarding the correction of the minutes of the July meeting. Where does that stand? Uh, 
um, those minutes have been revised and they are getting ready to be sent to our chair for certification. Once she certifies those, we will get them out to everybody. Will we have a chance to review the corrections before they're certified? Um, no. <laughs> uh, doesn't that defeat the purpose? Um, we can. I can share them with you before she certifies them, and then we'll have her certify them. It seems to me that that would be a better procedure if we're talking about I noticed there was a, an email uh, regarding new procedures for the processing of minutes. Um, and it would seem to me that after there's been any corrections, uh, they should be resubmitted to the cab for approval before they are finally certified. Yep, those are two separate sets of minutes. This is the correction. So um, the correction, I will send out, to, I'll send that out to you before I send it to the chair to certify. Okay, but what would you, will, will that be part of the normal process? In other words, will we get a chance to review the corrections? When the draft minutes come out, yes. then we review, and then they come back to us before they go for certification? Yes. Okay. And I have not received any um, revisions on that set of minutes yet. On the July minutes? On the September. On the September minutes. Yeah, they're due by tomorrow morning. Is that correct? Yes. I beg your pardon? July will be sent back to you before they're certified by the chair. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I actually had not received that motion, so that's important to know. And let's see, any other new business? Other members? Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in light of not having the revisions from last July's minutes yet to review, I would propose that we have Stephen's motion pending the sending of the minutes and the review by the committee. That's certainly acceptable to me. Comments from other members? All right, so we will, we are waiting for the July minutes for us to, repro uh, to review, we'll and then, the and then we'll keep the motion into consideration, thank you. All right, any other new business? Mark, do you have anything else? I'm sorry, say that again? Mark, do you have anything else? Your placard is up. I am sorry, it's okay. going down. All right, thank you. All right, excellent. Now we will move on to an update and look ahead from N3B, Brad Smith, our president and general manager, Brad. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm Brad Smith, president and general manager of N3B. First, happy new year to everybody. We haven't been together since the new year occurred, so looking forward to this year. I want to introduce a couple of members of my staff. We have Kevin Reed and Kristen Henderson. So say hi. They're going to be discussing, or not Kristen. Kevin will be helping us with MDH here in the presentation uh, in the agenda, as you will see. And before I go on, um, sometimes unscripted things are the best. And this isn't in my talking notes, but I would be remiss if I didn't truly thank Michael Michelinas to my left. Um, since I have been president and general manager, he has been nothing but kind and gracious to help me acclimate. And it's not often you get somebody with the intellect to also go along with their integrity and caring. And he truly cares about the mission here. So thank you very much. So for the fiscal year 24 look ahead, uh, our, the primary areas of our uh, 24 work is around waste disposition. That includes driving down legacy waste inventory. We heard a little bit about that this morning when uh, the whip breakfast and the success we've had there. And the shipping waste increases public safety and helps protect water quality, which again, reiterating that is very important to us. At TA54, regards to our low level waste and mixed low level waste campaigns, uh, since contracts start, we have shipped approximately 1,880 containers out of TA54. 
our fiscal year 24 goal is to ship the final 451 containers. Why that matters is that actually closes out this effort in 2024 for shipping the mixed low level and low level waste offsite for what we have currently. Additionally, um, waste will be generated and shipped from our aggregate area programs. So as we go in, and I will explain here in a minute, that as we do work, you create potential waste streams and we have to get rid of them because we're not going to store them here. There's staging, but ultimate storage, as we discussed, as Michael discussed this morning at WIP, we have other repositories we use in Nevada, Utah, and other certified waste sites around the United States. For true waste, our corrugated metal pipes, um, we continue to make progress. Uh, the winter was somewhat kind to us. Uh, we had snowfall, but the crews overcame that. We've added another crew to what we're doing, and we've also provided an incentive plan for the workforce to attain this milestone. The waste drum inventory at T-54, we're continuing to make progress and we're continuing on our pit nine planning. So there's um, a high material at risk glove box because part of how we're going to execute this work is uh, being considered. And we just made a trip to Tennessee with our folks that are doing the work and they've gotten some good feedback. So the design and uh, beginning of the build will begin fiscal year 24. As far as environmental remediation, which a little bit of what Kevin will be talking about, we've submitted two drilling work plans to New Mexico Environment Department for Summer 3 and R79, which is Rev 1. And we've submitted the final uh, Solid Waste Management Unit Assessment Report for Middle DP Road a month ahead of schedule. So hopefully that gets disposition because that allows us to turn that land back uh, from an economic development effort to Los Alamos. So very much looking forward to that. For aggregate areas, um, we want to continue to progress this important thing as, this, as far as cleaning up the land. We've completed two of the seven campaigns and now the other five are actually all ongoing right now. Each one of these MDAs, the material disposal areas, is unique. So they are rep repositories for previous uh, activities at Los Alamos that we're cleaning up, but each one, as you all know, and the, hearing the discussions and deliberations, know that the waste that has been placed in there is, is different from one to the next. For Two Mile Canyon Aggregate Area, we're going to complete our field work and submit investigation reports, which includes the risk assessment to NMED. I look at Ricardo next to me, so. And to limit uh, remobilization, we're going to sample for PCBs. Uh, again, if you've got an indication of something, that is something we can add, so that'll be in the investigation reports. The challenge in working around potential beryllium areas is also there, so we have to put our workers into the beryllium protection program. I don't know who that was, that was me, sorry. Patrillo and fence aggregate areas, uh, we're going to continue to work the cultural resource aspect, we're uh, working around collect, collecting samples, pardon me, multiple locations, multiple depths, and again, this is another pr uh, potential beryllium area requiring additional work controls. Starmer Upper Pajarito Aggregate Area, that site investigation continues. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about the gun site, which we've had, we're going to go back in. We had a suspension of activities due to um, insufficient oversight at N3B. Uh, we are recovering that and we're going to be doing more hand drilling. So again, as you get near archeological or uh, culturally sensitive areas, you don't use heavy equipment. It is more hand work so that you can take care of what you're doing and how you're collecting your samples. Chikawi, uh, we're in phase three investigations. And once we're through with those, that'll help build our work plans that we'll submit to NMED. Lower Pajarito and uh, the aggregate areas scheduled to begin field work in February, March timeframe. And this is the first time we're actually in this area. So we're taking the lessons learned from the other aggregate areas and applying to the work plans in that. Sampling is, is central to our work. Um, it helps us identify the areas that require remediation because not everything is the same. And a single phase approach 
use going from one to the next. Again, the lessons learned and the crews and what we're retaining as far as our subcontract support is really important. In regards to sampling, since contracts start in April 2018, we've collected more than 13,000 soil and sediment samples. We've collected more than 20,000 water samples, and we've undertaken more than 13,000 stormwater control inspections. So when we are asked, how do we know that we're protective of uh, human ecological health, that is the process we utilize to submit our plans to the Mexico Environment Department and have that data reviewed. And if there's any discrepancies, then we circle back and have that discussion. For the material disposal areas, um, we've talked about Kevin being here to take us through MDAH. Uh, MDAL at fiscal year 24 will be proposing a cleanup plan and that'll, and again, I know that there's been interest, so that'll be a future meeting topic, and we look forward to your recommendations. And we are uh, going to restart the sampling and vapor uh, operations uh, spring and fall 24. For MDA A and T, vapor sampling will continue to support our uh, corrective measures evaluation. MDAs, C as in Charlie, MDA L, MDA G, we're gonna continue vapor sampling. So each of these remedial, remedial plan targets are protecting our human and ecological health. And as we get those discussions again back with NMED and, and the stakeholders, that'll help form a basis of how we go forward to remediate those. One of the important things that I started to allude to, I believe at our last CAB meeting, and we talked a little bit on our tour, was around operational excellence. We're implementing a new program. And while, what this means is we know what we're going to do, but how we do it matters. Because if we don't protect the immediate worker, if we don't protect the public, if we don't protect the environment, then we can't work safely and we will not continue on. And our workforce has heard that by protecting them and if they follow their procedures, then by extension, you can protect the other items that I've talked about with the public and the environment. So with that in mind, uh, this is going to be a new department reporting in to me, the Office of the President, and it's to do a couple things. One, N3B, since its inception, for many reasons, especially having broken off from LANL, it ended up in silos. So environmental remediation has been kind of in its department. Contact Handle True and TA54 has kind of been in its department, because if you think about their missions, they're a little different. TA54 is largely operations, if you look at the aggregate areas and the other things that environmental remediation does, it is doing the investigation and cleanup. We want to, though, use our engineering, our environmental safety health professionals. We want to use our procurement professionals, the core business functions that are at N3B, to really make one way to do business. So we've embarked on that since last summer, but we're, through this new department, is going to stand that up. The gentleman I've asked to do this uh, it was a former project manager at the Pueblo Chemical uh, Weapons Depot and the uh, decommissioning of it, so he knows, he is very well versed. He's been at Idaho. He understands our work, which is really important, and hopefully I can get him to a, a CAB meeting at some point to have a discussion and you can get to meet Brett. Brett Grieveno is his name. Um, another thing this does is it really does enhance the safety, compliance, and training aspects for our workforce. Because if I want to utilize anybody from, say, TA-54 to ER work, I can do that if I provide the right training. So we are reaching out to Northern New Mexico College with our apprentice programs. We are working with the universities, or it's New Mexico, Los Alamos, um, Mexico State, putting a high emphasis on getting additional education in for our workforce. That will help the how, because the other pieces, as we start and continue retirements, if you look at the next three to five years, I think most industries that have been ongoing, Los Alamos has talk, spoken about this, we have a gap in trying to make sure that we train people so that the mission continues. And it's really important we do that and it let people particularly in northern New Mexico, understand that there are opportunities. Everybody focuses on the youth, which is very, very important because that's future work. But we have other people who might be not looking at a career at Los Alamos. We've 
recently hired some folks that came out of some casinos. They had actually had oil and gas experience, but because it had been turned down, they didn't know that this was an opportunity here at Los Alamos. So N3B, we're using this as an opportunity to screen those. Also, the military, we are going to the uh, demobilization uh, centers and working with their recruitment centers to say, hey, in the next six months, 12 months, what sorts of skill sets do you have that can come out? Because it isn't just engineers and just field workers. We've got people that are industrial hygienists. We have people who are industrial safety experts. We have people who are, uh, have worked with NMED uh, at Kirtland Air Force Base and getting their environmental permits. So if I can help you know, military folks that are uh, leaving, then that's, a, that's not only a gain for the country, but it's a gain for the area and the experience we can, we can keep. The last thing it really does for us is the safety conscious work environment. We've talked about that. Uh, there was the Oak Ridge Associated Universities uh, survey that was done. Michael and my predecessors, uh, Kim Leback and Joe Laguerre, uh, chartered this. We have continued to improve our workforce aspects from a culture standpoint, respect, being able to have dialogue. You can have a differing professional opinion, but still have a respectful discourse. And as we continue that, now we have had enough new people come in, we need to refresh that. So I'm working with uh, the folks at DOE headquarters and with Michael's staff to actually re-up and have this safety conscious work environment training. So it's a little bit different. For those that come in and aren't used to it, it sounds simple, but when you have complex high hazard tasks and you get stress involved, the next thing that can happen is if you're not used to how you're coached, how you speak, tone matters. And I think when we talk about, we get into a deliberation on say a permit mod, if somebody goes in and immediately sets the tone, I'm not listening, it's not going to end well. Uh, back to the appreciation I have for Michael and Ellie and EMLA is the fact that we've made a promise to each other that we can have hard discussions, but it has to be respectful and it's to accomplish a mission. Because at the end of the day, even the cab is about accomplishing a cleanup mission. So the more I can impart that to my new employees and have respect for those of you that are there, at the end of the day, when they go home, they're drinking the water, they're eating the food, there's a direct impact on everything they do. And so we're trying to make sure they understand that, appreciate that, and represent us as, as best they can. Well, the way that starts, though, is from me down. So. The last piece, accountability versus responsibility. Um, one of the things that can happen in any organization is you start holding people accountable, they immediately trip to, well, am I gonna get fired? And we think those that have children, you know, if, if somebody comes in and they're, I've always heard any attention's better than no attention. And that isn't always true because again, we have people that really might not understand their jobs but I can still demonstrate to them, here is the schedule you're to keep, here's the work plan you're supposed to use, here's the permit. So if I use from what the Department of Energy standards are, what the New Mexico Environment Department standards are, what the Environmental Protection Agency standards are, et cetera, and I flow that down, ultimately it's do I follow the piece of paper in front of me when I go to work? And that's all I want them to do. So that accountability though then ramps up to where when you get to my level, then it's the project. So to report to you and to say that we're executing our work the way we should as taxpayers, then that's my job. So as you hear this, um, any feedback is welcome. I, I truly look at feedback as a gift. I don't always like the feedback I get, but it's something I can work on. So truly, um, as we embark on this, I'll give an update to how, how this is progressing, but as this operational excellence program kicks off, as I start to create 1N3B, then that will kickstart the mission where everybody understands why they're here, what they're doing, and what we're accomplishing. That's the end of my update. Although I was told I need to give a, a shout out for the upcoming EMCF, so Environmental Management Cleanup Forum, uh, February 15th, 2024, uh, it's the Sala Events Center in Los Alamos, just down the road from Fuller Lodge, and there will also have virtual 5.30 to 7.30 Mountain. Focus is going to be waste disposition with updates by Michael, and also time for community Q&A. With that, I thank you. 
Thank you, Brad. What, what was that date again? February 15th? February 15th. Fuller Lodge. Uh, Sala Event Center. Sala? Sala. Okay. And that's in Los Alamos? Yeah, for, and, and for that, those yeah Los who... Alamos, just down the road from Fuller Lodge. Okay. Kristen's looking at me going, yes. Okay. For, for those of us who don't know where the Sala is, that it is down from Fuller Lodge, correct? Mm -hmm. It's past Fuller Lodge. Okay, past Fuller Lodge. So it is in Los Alamos. It's on Central, past Fuller Lodge. Thank you. Appreciate that, Brett. Thank you for your update. Any questions? Oh, Sterling? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Brad? Uh, I... My notes reflect that we had that you, that you had N3B had two stop work orders last year. Could you uh, enlighten us as to what N3B has done as a result of those stop work orders? Absolutely. Um, so I would say, taken in aggregate, this is the um, one of the outcomes from the heat stress event was the fact that we did not have a culture that people could stop. People were reluctant for whatever reason, didn't matter. You know, so to address that, as part of that Oak Ridge Associated University survey I was telling you about, we needed to upgrade not only our employee concerns program, but our safety conscious work environment program, of which stop work is one of those. No retribution, no retaliation for someone bringing to whomever I need to stop because the conditions aren't right. And as we uh, entered into the training qualification issue, which was really the major one uh, in August, it was because there was a misunderstanding of one, the requirements, two, when the training program was evaluated, it was at a top level and as this software program was utilized and they tested it, it could show that you're qualified, but there was some coding underneath that didn't really catch. So if I had a core training, let's say I had three things I had to do. To come into the room, I had to understand the occupancy. Let's say I have to understand what the hazards are in the room, and then just how do I respond if something happens? I'm just sim simplifying this. Well, it could show that the software showed me that I was qualified for that, but the dates didn't necessarily show up properly. So we ended up being horribly out of date with some of the people. It would kind of, the analogy I would use is you could, you could have been driving for 20 years and you look down and you see your driver's license has expired. It doesn't make you less proficient, but you're not legal. So what we had to do was go back and look at what pieces and parts, because every, every group was a little bit different, to be able to go and get back into compliance with our training qualification program, which we have done. <clears throat> the outfall of that also is that we have an improvement initiative with what's called a learning management system. For those that worked at LANL, you train, or you work at other places, typically if you go online and you take a course, it automatically goes into your HR file so that you know that you're qualified to execute whatever your assigned job is. We're, that within the next two and a half, three months is where we will be. We will have transitioned from the, uh, let's just say the more difficult, less integrated software we were using to something that is fit for purpose that has been used elsewhere in the Department of Energy that when people come in, it can take your old training records and overlay them to say, you're qualified, we can give you an equivalency, or you're coming due in the next 90 days and it gives a countdown to make sure that before you go out to work, you're fully qualified. No questions asked, easy, push a button, I can hand it to you and you know every morning where you stand. So it's been very manual with what we have done. Um, the other stop work, again, comes back to if People don't understand, and this was in the aggregate areas um, and the Manhattan Project, we had inadequate oversight. And so we basically had to enact some improvement opportunities and compensatory measures to make sure that our subcontractors have oversight, which we had field 
engineers who were doing that, but it's still on us as a company to oversee our subcontractors. And so we're bolstering that. We are presenting what we are doing. We've, we are working with Triad and NALA on what we are doing, but in essence, it really is just bolstering our oversight program to make sure that our subcontractors, the flow down was there, but we failed in the fact that people weren't there as we were expecting. And when we went back and looked at what the field orders were and what the work packages said, it left a lot of room. So each of us might have looked at what we were going to do and interpreted it differently. So if some of us might have stayed out there all day. Others may have felt that if I just go and start in the morning and check in in the evening, that's okay. Well, back to I need to be explicit what the expectations are because the hazards are different in each place and lay that out, make sure that people understand what their accountability is supposed to be, and if something happens, stop. And that's where we're at right now. So we are in a graded restart. We've, we've begun some of our aggregate area work. However, over the next uh, two to four weeks, we will be back full bore with our ER campaigns in the aggregate areas. Uh, we'll have the archeological support from Triad because they want to also look at what we're doing. But this is something, nevertheless, we do have a working arrangement with Triad on. So we do integrate where we're going and what we're doing. So in essence, that was it. It was uh, one, uh, we, did, we knew it was inadequate oversight. The other one, um, it was some of the software and some of the way people had um, looked at their qualifications. And quite frankly, we just didn't do a good job of the implementation. If you don't mind, I'd like to add just a little bit on that too. Thank you for the for that, Brad. Uh, this is Michael McLean's uh, field office manager for Los Alamos. Uh, on the two work stoppages, um, <clears throat> the 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 one with the subs in the in the uh, soil and cleanup part. This just like the Department of Energy, we have N3B that does work for us and that actually performs the cleanup mission. I have eyes and ears that are put out in the field, they're called facility rep representatives who watch and oversee what the contractor does in the field. <clears throat> I have program people that oversee the development of the paper and things like that. When N3B further subcontracts work out, in this case, what they bring in companies to actually do the soil investigation and clean up where necessary. What Brad is talking about is the people that he puts in the field, they're called subcontract technical representatives to oversee and watch what their subs are doing in the field to make sure they're, they're doing what's been authorized, they're following the rules, et cetera. The, uh, <clears throat> the incidents that caused, and one of the incidents caused uh, a damage to a historical piece of, um, an, an artifact out there, a bowl. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the finding of that was that the, his, his oversight wasn't strong enough. So that's what he's talking about. He has taken actions to strengthen it. Uh, we've con we work closely with uh, um, Lanol and and uh, Triad because they maintain their relationship with the state on historical preservations. We've put in place actions to ensure this won't happen again. We've, we're ensuring N3B has stronger oversight of their subcontracts. They've tightened up some of their requirements that were a little too loose. An example, what am I talking about where the subs are out there? Probably an egregious example of is where one subcontractor began work in the field that wasn't authorized on the plan of the day. Before work is released, whether it's his work or a sub's work, the managers and people responsible for safe performance and making sure that an activity over here is not gonna be unsafe for the people over here and vice versa, it's reviewed and then put on a plan of the day for authorization to go do the work. And one of the subs actually started doing something that wasn't authorized on the, on the plan of the day. That's, a, that's potentially a very serious thing. Um, <clears throat> but those corrective measures have been put in place. And we're going to, and we're resuming work. With the respect to the training and qualification, I appreciated what uh, what Brad brought to the table on that. This was actually self-identified in a review in another area, and when our our uh, corporate partners pulled the string on this, uh, they they kept finding an issue and a dig. It's a kind of like pulling a string on a tapestry, and the whole thing starts to unravel. It it turns out it wasn't just a a small problem or hiccup or an error. It was a fundamental problem with the program. He, he gave you some details regarding the computer programs and things, but let me roll it up a little bit higher. 
the way I assure you, members of the public, elected officials, tribal nations who live right next to the, uh, to the lab in some cases, that the people we put in the field to do the work are competent and capable of doing the work is by having a training and qualification program. The Nuclear Navy does that. The, Navy, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission requires that of key positions and key uh, operations in nuclear power plants. The Department of Energy does it too. We, there, we can't take the time to go and individually check out every operator, every shift supervisor, whether they're competent and they really know what they're doing. We have a program that requires an initial qualification. You go through the classes and, and get examined and signed off on your card and you're qualified. We have requirements that period, periodically, it's usually every two years, you go through refresher training and requalification. <clears throat> the program was not ensuring that. That is the only way I can assure the public, my leadership in Washington, D.C., that the workers that we put in the field are competent and, and have the competence kept commensurate with the responsibilities they have to protect the environment, their co-workers, and the public. Now, the, uh, um, the qualification program issue that caused the stop work, please don't equate that with the workers were not competent to do the work. They didn't know what they were doing, actually. In the cases I personally looked at and, and spoke with workers, I feel there was competence there. But it's not, this is not an issue about whether the workers were competent or not. This is an issue of whether the process that I rely upon, short of every month or two interviewing the workers to make sure they're retaining the proficiency, um, that, that process wasn't being implemented correctly and assuring the government that the people that were going on the field were getting the periodic refresher training. One of the fellows I spoke to has certifications for operating a forklift. He's done forklift operations for 30 years. And he teaches other people how to go do that. And his calls were one of the ones that expired. And, and he asked, why am I doing, why am I having to go do this? Why, why is this a problem? I'm, I, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing it for 30 years. And, and my reply was exactly what I just shared with you. It's not about your personal knowledge. It's not about whether I think you do or do not have the competence. I don't care as far as me personally going out and validating it, because that's not the process. I don't have the time. It would be an inefficient use of taxpayer dollars if I asked the contractor's management or my own to go out and interview everybody every two years. To, to, we, that's why we have a process to go do that. So it was a pretty significant um, issue, a programmatic issue. The contractor stopped work in all nuclear operations and promptly went and requalified all of their workers gave them the training that they needed. It, rather than trying to take the time to figure out, if, okay, what does Tom know and what does Sally know and what does Pete know? No, just said, we're gonna go redo the training. Took us about six weeks, eight weeks to get through, got back to work, but that's the way you do business. That's the way I believe the, the Citizens Advisory Board would expect us to do the work. That's what we think the public, the Pueblos, environmental and citizens groups, they would expect and demand nothing less. And we've, um, and we've had, we, we held the contractor accountable in performance space on that as well. Again, something you should demand, nothing less. The contractor held themselves accountable and that mitigates some of how much we hold them accountable. But this is the way the work should be done. It, it, we took a hit in production and performance and in, in performing the mission for a few months. It's impacted my corrugated metal pipe um, uh, project. But you don't, as I heard the manager from, the call, from uh, WIP this morning say, we can only operate at the speed of safety. You don't go faster than the speed of safety. So I just wanted to add a little bit. That was a great question. What about those two work stoppages and what do they mean? Um, the, the training and qualification one was the more serious one. The, the, the uh, control of the subs in the field um, could be bigger if it had been allowed and the, and the subs have gotten out, you know, Nobody's minding the, the folks doing the work in the field, but uh, I'm satisfied with my corporate partner's actions to address the issues. They looked at them objectively, uh, objectively identified, um, I, fault is the wrong word, um, responsibility, and they've addressed those issues. I, I ask for nothing less than my corporate partners, and you should expect nothing less from the federal government doing this work. Thank you for the question. And one final piece. Michael came out at my behest saying the workforce really needs to hear what it is, what he just explained, that 
because they were, they just didn't understand. You know, I've been doing this yesterday. Why today are you making me stop? It also did something else for us, though, and back to the, you know, working at the speed of safety. It demonstrated to them that we understood the gravity of where we were going and what we were doing, but we still did what we had to do. Because that's the trust I have to come and impart to you that I'm not just going to go and cut corners and I never want to be judged for what I didn't do because at the end of the day, you never want that rework. You don't want to have the potential where somebody gets, heaven forbid, somebody gets hurt or there's a release. And this is that way I can protect that. So Michael really and, and EMLA truly stepped up and helped us to impart that. When Greg Sasson came out, uh, for new EM3 from DOE headquarters in December, he stopped by our corrugated metal pipe campaign and spoke with some of the workers. And the more we reinforce this about this, you know, the seriousness we take this and their safety, the better we're going to be. So back to the operational excellence. Thank you, Brad and Michael. I appreciate that. Jose, please. Madam Chair. Brad, I, um, Michael, I appreciate your candid, just straight up, la meta meta. You're just calling it for what it is. If we can't um, take care of our workers, they can't take care of us. The, the, PPE, the PPE gear that they wear for the work that they do out there, boots on ground, I mean, if they're not trained to put on that PPE gear, they're gonna go home, it's gonna be a broken seal, they're gonna get contaminated, they're gonna get sick, they're gonna die. Bottom line, by our respects. And guess who's gonna be going down over there to take care of that family? I'll be taking care of that family. So, on a serious note, you know, as a, a cab member, I listen. I'm, I'm listening to both of you, and I take it at heart. Um, did you say, um, Brad, uh, PCB? That you guys are going to be doing something there, the two mile with PCB stuff? Is that what it was? Yes, uh, there, there are potentials. So we react and protect what we do for controls based upon potential, not for actual, because until you get the characterization, you don't know. So you lean in with the right PPE and protect them before they go in during the investigation work. Understood. So it's just preventative. Understood. Um, that PPE gear is so important, right? Um, I had a, my brother was a police officer with the city of Santa Fe Police Department. He was exposed to PPE and, not PPE, but PCB. And, um, and he died because of that because he didn't have, at that time, they were the old school. Um, that they didn't have training for that particular chemical or whatever. The, um, the archeological site stuff that you talk about in Pajarito, the site investigation, I appreciate that from a, a tribal perspective. The cultural sensitivity of, you might, might come across that. And our, our tribal nations need to be um, part of that process of um, taking care of our, our cultural patrimonial items. So the objectives and the missions of, three, of N3B um, is greatly appreciated. The way you guys are going at that, that direction, of you're, you're protecting the environment, but you're also t protecting the, the employees. I appreciate that. The workforce recruitment, the SMEs, thank you for bringing up the military, our veterans. They need to be part of that. And then the last thing, is, again, is the accountability and responsibility of the employees. They need to take responsible for their actions and they need to be held accountable. If they can't do the function, then they should be doing the work. So I appreciate the, your input, both of you. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Jose, I appreciate your comments. And um, just to, from my perspective, um, quickly, so, Brad and Michael, you'll be changing the training software that you use now to the one that Triad 
has used a system similar to that, like the U train, such as the U train system, or is it the U train itself? No. Okay. It, it's something similar, but the idea is that we're having it so it integrates with our human resource records and other areas so that when you hit the button, you know that yes. Elena can go out and do work today. And right now, it's it, you have to dig quite a bit, and it's very labor intensive, so this will automate more similar to the way the other sites work. Okay. And so based on the employee's position and duties, those trainings will be tailored to... They will, have, they will be assigned specific trainings tailored to what they do. Right, and Excellent. so everybody here, the way we assign how you become qualified is that when you get hired in through our human resource uh, department, there is what's called a qualification standard. And it'll give you anything from 10 items that you need to do your job up to, we've got some that are up to 38. We're reevaluating those as we go right now because we've seen that there are some things that really were Los Alamos National Lab related, not N3B related, and you really don't need them. If we think about maintenance personnel, they used to go all over Lanel, so they could go into a high explosives area or they could go into just normal room maintenance. Well, there are large differences in the type of qualifications you need to go do that. So we're using this as an opportunity to truly tailor what's needed for the workers, and it's called a need a job task analysis. Then we look at the suite of courses available to us, whether it's through LANL or ourself, or even we use the National Training Center out of Albuquerque for our HAZWAP or Hazardous Waste Operations uh, coursework. And that's another thing that the Department of Energy has been kind enough to let us utilize more is they bring instructors to N3B to help us overcome what we'll call some of the access limitations. Because just like we have many of our uh, nuclear operations staff come up from Albuquerque, we have others that if they have to go from uh, anywhere else in northern New Mexico, we have some, Las, uh, some workers from Las Vegas, we have some from Four Corners. Well, we want to make this as convenient as we can because then that makes people more likely to attend. And so we're trying to come up with the best way to do that and with that qualification standard we can share it with whether it's New Mexico Environment Department, if you all ask what makes Brad qualified to do it, what he does, I have this documentation similar to what Michael was saying. It's really predicated on what you need. And then once we get that, then the next thing is you take your coursework and then the new learning management system will just take each of us and what we are required to do for our job, and that will be loaded in, and then from that point forward, it's automated. If I can kind of pull some, this is the, this is the simple view of, the, of a federal employee, so bear with me. What I've seen work and what's been done in successfully at other places in the department, um, there are automated systems that take the database with all the people's training records in it, the database that is used to fill out a watch bill, who's going to be working in what position during the day doing what, the, the uh, database that says here's the competencies and the training required for Joe and Pete and Sally for what the different jobs they have, all those things, and, and there's a, a learning management system that, that Brad's talking about, but all those things are linked together and automated because if you try to do that by human, that's where the error comes in. And human error is 50%. Not a, it's a pretty high percentage when, when you start using um, skill the craft like that, an expert uh, hum, human error happens, so it's automated. Even with automated systems, there are still hiccups and mistakes made, uh, but we're, we're working to get to an automated system. The N3B has correctly defined the qual standards and the task and the competencies that are needed. They were assigned to the individuals appropriately, um, the, but the, the connection to the training database um, isn't automated, and there's not an automation that when the watch bill is put together, it checks the database to make sure Joe and Pete and Sally are, Sally are curtain, current in their quals. The short-term fix to get back to work safely at the speed of safety it was to retrain the people. They did that, we're back to work safely. Uh, the long-term fix is to go automate those systems, and that's an improvement. When the Department of Energy um, put out the RFP for uh, the different contractors to compete for, and, and we awarded it to N3B. We 
we uh, presumed and promised our contractor that certain things were gonna come over as part of the contract. A learning management system was one of them. U-Train was one of them. It turns out it wasn't able to be for reasons that would take another hour to talk about, and I don't know all the details to do it. We weren't able to provide that, so the contractor had to make their own learning management system. Hence was born the embryo of the, of the uh, problem that we encountered uh, last year. So long-term fix is in process, and uh, I'm, I, I just wanted to add that little part, Elena, just the automated part that will really give us the, the fix moving forward. That's good to know. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Brad. Any other comments or questions from members? In the room, online? Megan uh, from Hazardous Waste Bureau, please. Hi, thanks. I was just wondering if other sites um, had similar systems, and if not, will this be sort of a testing ground, and will you share that with other sites? So, good question, Megan. Thank you. The Yes, other sites do have it, and I, this won't surprise you. Every site practically has their own process and their own software. Uh, the Department of Energy has a learning management system called Learning Nucleus, but those occasionally, but it seems to me like about every decade, we get a new learning management system put in place. So even at a particular site, the federal version of this, because we have federal training and qualifications as well, contractors use a different learning management system than the feds do. And where you have three contractors on the site, let's say, like at Oak Ridge, each of the contractors is allowed to have their own learning management system and the federal government has to go look at that and make sure, okay, is it a good one or not? So there's not a requirement to make them all consistent. And the, the premise for that, I believe, is if we mandate a one-size-fits-all and it, it could increase the cost because now somebody who has an otherwise effective learning management system that they've been using for in their own industry for a long time now has to go change all their systems, get familiar with it, et cetera drives the taxpayer's cost up a bit. So it, it's, it's, it, it makes it harder to manage. I hope I answered your question. But we are sharing lessons learned. The lessons learned here were shared across the EM complex. That's good to know. Thank you. And thanks for your, your question, Megan. So just to follow up, I know we need to move along on the agenda. But um, so the sites with their own learning management systems are site specific, and then they're adaptive to that site. In a nutshell, yes. Thank you. All right, to sum up. All right, thank you. Now let's move on to our update from our friends from the Hazardous Waste Bureau. And I believe I forgot to uh, apologize, Neelam. I know Neelam Dewan is online from the NMED Hazardous Waste Bureau. Welcome, Neelam. And Ricardo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Buenas tardes, le de Dios a todos. Good afternoon. So I am here on behalf of um, Director Rick Sheen of the, Hazard of the Resource Protection Division. And again, uh, Megan McLean here, uh, acting with Program Manager. So I will be providing the LANL update, and Megan will be providing the WIP update, and then we will be open for questions after that. I apologize, there might be some, um, some information that was already discussed by Brad earlier. But uh, to risk missing something, I'm just going to read all the information from the LANL sheet. Uh, there is quite a bit. So uh, my update this morning, this afternoon, will focus on the consent order, on groundwater, corrective action documents, middle DP road, and LANL permit related activities. So consent order, the proposed FY24 Appendix B was submitted on July 28th. NMED and DOE and the permittees have had multiple meetings to negotiate the proposal, and a meeting occurred this morning, as a matter of fact, to negotiate the last item needing resolution to finalize Appendix B. Uh, I did uh, bump into Neelan before I came, but I was not able to ask her how that meeting went. So maybe in the next meeting, we'll have an update on that meeting. Uh, I will add that, yes, I'm very glad that Neelim Dewan is online, so any questions related to LANL, she'll be available to help address. Moving on to groundwater. Well, R73 was plugged and abandoned with oversight from NMED and the Office of State Engineer on September 10th of last year. Dewey has submitted a causal analysis on December 20th, 2023. 
A notice of disapproval was sent for Chromium IM and characterization work plan on May 31st. The notice of, dispro notice of disapproval required that DOE propose an alternative location to injection as part of the revised document. NMED and DOE met on July 24th to discuss the disagreements with comments. DOE then provided comment responses to the NOD and a meeting was held on October 26th to continue those discussions. NMED reviewed the comment responses and issued the feedback in a letter sent back to the permittees on January 3rd of this year. NMED has approved the R76 drilling work plan on June 8th, and the drilling of R76 began on September 21st. DOE requested a variance from the Office of State Engineer on November 24th, which was denied by the Office of State Engineer on November 28th, and suspended the permit for R76 until DOE submits the required information. NMED, Office of State Engineer, and DOE have had several meetings to clarify the information request. DOE has not submitted all the information required by Office of State Engineer, and the permit is currently suspended. DOE submitted the revised drilling work plan for R79 on October 27th to a accommodate Office of State Engineer's requirement for a single screen wells. NMED has reviewed the submission and issued review comments on January 22nd. The Office of State Engineer returned the permit application for well R80 on January 3rd due to the proposed dual screen design. NMED will review a revised drilling plan for R80 to accommodate the single screen design. The Chromium IM has been shut down since April 1st. DOE and NMED have not yet agreed on a path forward. NMED has required that DOE propose an alternative injection location for the extraction and treatment of contaminated water to resume. A letter was sent by NMED to DOE on September 6th to propose a path forward for continued remediation of the chromium plume. NMED provided acceptable corrective actions that would allow for a temporary recommencement of the injections while an alternative location is developed. NMED has also discussed the need to retain an independent mediator at the rec recommendation of the General Accountability Office and the Radioactive and Hazardous Materials Interim Committee recommendations. DOE has sent a response letter on December 5th that stated disagreement with the proposed corrective actions and stated that DOE has retained um, technical staff from Savannah River site, Savannah River National Labs, to perform a technical review of the interim measure operation. NMED specifically has proposed additional independent technical experts for inclusion. NMED and DOE attended the Pueblo de San Delfonso Tribal Council working session on October 16th to discuss the proposed monitoring of well, and I'm not sure if this is SIMR or SIMR-3. Do you guys know? Thank you, so I was just told that it is the San Aldefonso Tribal Council monitoring well, number three, on Pueblo land. So the Simmer 3 is proposed as a dual screen design to monitor potential contamination south of the injection location near the Pueblo boundary. NMED is continuing discussions with DOE and the Pueblo de San Delfonso Department of Environmental and Cultural Preservation to de determine if Simmer 3 will be completed as a single screen or dual screen design. NMED has presented an update on the status of the Chromium project to the Buckman Direct Diversion Board on November 2nd. Moving on to corrective action documents, NMED has issued a statement of basis for MDAC on September 7th that proposed the remedy include the excavation of waste for appropriate final disposal and active soil vapor extraction of the VOC plume. 
The final remedy will be selected after considering input from the public. The public comment period ended on November 6th, and NMED has received three requests for public hearing on the statement of basis. The hearing requests were from Triad National Security, EMLA N3B, and from Nuclear Watch New Mexico. NMED is in the process of scheduling the public hearing and the public comment period has been extended to the close of that public hearing whenever it uh, will be finalized and scheduled. NMED has approved the final investigation work plan for MD, MDAA on September 20th. NMED issued an approval with modifications for the final investigation work plan for MDAT on October 4th. NMED approved the phase three investigation work plan for Chikawi Canyon aggregate area on November 28th. Moving on to Middle DP Road, DOE has completed field investigations and NMED received the Solid Waste Management Unit ass Assessment Report for Middle DP Road site on December 22nd. The report is now under NMED review. Moving on to LANL permit related activities. Renewal application, so that would be the 10 year renewal application for the LANL permit was submitted in 2020. NMED has sent two administratively incomplete determinations to DOE. NMED is now waiting for DOE to submit a revised application that includes an additional storage unit. NMED has approved a class one permit modification on September 14th to add a treatment to building 0069 at technical area 50. So that concludes my update on the LANL items. Uh, before moving on to the WIP items, I did want to say, uh, just reading through this, right, is remember that there is a lot of work going on, a lot of different work. NMED Hazardous Waste Bureau continues to try and staff up. There has been um, over several years, I think since COVID, kind of a hard time to, to hire. And it's especially hard to compete with the LANLs, uh, the lab to our north and Sandia to the south. And it's, it's, they pay more. And so it is hard, especially the technical activities. So just want to shout out to the Bureau and their staff. It's a lot of work going on and we appreciate everything they do. So I'll turn it over to Megan for the WIP update. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Yes, you, you all do a lot with very few resources and we appreciate what you can what you are able to complete and it's it is it is commendable so i appreciate that mm. megan thanks ricardo uh thank you for having me here it's the first time i've been at a cab meeting although i've prepared updates for various upper management members for years now um i am currently acting with program manager while Ricardo's in the bureau chief role, and it's been a great experience, especially going through the WIP negotiations for our current permit renewal. Um, since you all met last time, the permit renewal for WIP has become finalized. That occurred on November 3rd. Right now, the permittees and NMED are focused on implementing several new permit conditions that went into effect for this new permit. And one that is gonna be most interesting to you all is the prioritization of LANL waste, legacy waste, um, especially coming out of LANL, and something that's called the Legacy True Waste Disposal Plan. That's a new permit condition that, the aim of that condition is to first identify what the term legacy actually means, because it can mean different things at different DOE sites around the country and we don't have that defined in our permit at the current time, so it's to define that term legacy, and then also to identify um, the inventory of legacy waste at different DOE sites around the country. And the goal of this plan is to prioritize this legacy waste in panel 12 
other panels as well, but that's written into the permit condition that panel 12, to the extent possible, will be prioritized for legacy waste. Um, we're uh, especially interested in legacy waste coming out of Los Alamos so that we can clean that up for New Mexicans since that's the, that, that is who we serve. Um, right now, the permittees have been traveling to different generator storage sites around the country. They've been meeting with folks at those sites, but also with cabs at, um, at different sites. And I believe they met with you all. And I, um, if not, I will definitely encourage them to do so, because I think that's important. Um, so that's the main focus right now. Uh, they're also going to have, as far as permit modifications that are incoming for us. We're expecting a couple class ones to come in um, within the next month. And these also relate to our settlement agreement during negotiations. Um, one of them has to do with adding, making sure that the term tribal is consistent throughout the permit and that, um, that tribes are informed of um, public involvement opportunities. And the other has to do with um, flood zone designation at the facility. Uh, as far as, well, let me talk about the WIP maintenance outage. Right now, shipments have been paused. The last week for shipping was um, just occurred January 21st through 27th, and they're pausing shipments due to their annual maintenance outage. This began on January 25th, and it's a long one. It's running this year until April 1st. There may be opportunities to download some shipments to the underground during that time, but that's not clear at this time. We'll be learning more about what they're actually going to be doing during this maintenance outage in a meeting tomorrow. And as far as shipments that have come in so far for this calendar year, uh, we have an update from January 1st through January 22nd. So far, WIP has rece received 32 shipments. 26 have been from Idaho, three from Los Alamos, two from Savannah River, one from Oak Ridge, and that is, that is all of them. Thank you for having me, and I appreciate being here. We thank you. We thank you for the update. Members have questions? Beverly, did you? I just want to express my appreciation for um, and congratulations on the prioritization of Lano legacy waste going to WIP. I think that's just an incredible, wonderful news. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Beverly. Sterling? Madam Chair, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, support Beverly's uh, appreciation for the uh, prior prioritization. Uh, I was just wondering if the new or yeah, newly approved WIP permit has an end date for uh, WIP operations. And if so, what is it? There's not currently an end date. However, we added some conditions that will help us to basically the RICRA permits um, do not require that you have a closure date in the permit. And the only actual date that, um, that WIP needs to close by is once that land withdrawal at capacity limit has mm -hmm. been reached. Mm -hmm. And so we added conditions in, we added more language in the permit that reiterates that once that land withdrawal at limit is reached, you can't go over it. Mm -hmm. And also if, you know, right now, this last WIP renewal permit authorized panels 11 and 12, which are new panels that are being excavated. And um, once those panels, that limit has been reached, they're going to need new panels because they're not going to have reached their land withdrawal -like limit. If they do want those new panels, instead of going in through the normal RICRA permit modification process, we added a condition where now it has to come in through a renewal process. Mm -hmm. And part of that renewal process has uh, expanded requirements for them for their submittal, including um, 
letting us know what the inventory of waste is around the complex so we can decide, well, how much longer would you need this permit for? Um, in reality, what's going to happen is instead of a 10-year renewal, which is what they would usually be allowed, is probably in five years we're going to be doing a renewal again. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Mark? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a question for Megan. In terms of the uh, tour of WIP last year that got canceled, would that be revisited in 2024? Are you speaking of a tour for the cab members? Yes. Um, well, we were at the legislative breakfast this morning for WIP, and they definitely encouraged tours. And if we knew anyone that wanted to go on a tour, please reach out to them. So I do know that it's not a good idea to go during the maintenance outage because you won't be able to go underground because they need to have enough personnel there and there's not enough staff to make it safe. Um, so after April 1st, I think you should give them a call or you know set it up before then and they would definitely welcome you all coming back I'll then forward it to the cab leadership to consider a tour for after April of 2024 this year the other question I had sure. Megan was uh, this was an issue that came up in our last meeting whether or not the contents of shipments from Lanel to whip were classified as transuranic waste including legacy waste or is it classified as something different and owned by somebody else? Uh, we can't speak to whether it's legacy waste versus newly generated. Um, I mean, I guess I can. I know, I know some of it's legacy, yes, and some of it is newly gen that comes there, but it's not broken down for us like that. Um, basically, it's true mixed waste that, that arrives, maybe. Michael, would you be? <clears throat> uh, if I, Michael McLean, DOE, if I understand your question, we we send nothing but transuranic waste to to WIP. So I, I think your question was something else or owned by somebody else. The waste that we EM ships to uh, WIP <clears throat> is only transuranic waste and only lanol transuranic waste. I don't have anybody else's any other sites like transuranic waste in my areas, um, there we do, and we've spoken many times about how uh, uh, Carlsbad optimizes shipments and they'll put some newly generated waste or add some mind uh, and NSA waste, to new generated waste shipment if there's an extra space and I've got a drum that can fit in there. Um, <clears throat> but, and I don't have, I don't keep records of how they're commingled on that. I, I have a commitment uh, from the Office of Environmental Management starting in 2022 that changed the way DOE prioritize, prioritizes waste shipments, transuranic waste shipments. That now, <clears throat> Lanol is at is you know at ready shipping. So previously, when I had shipments ready, I, I kind of was putting them in a cupboard, right? I'm storing them up. They're certified, ready to go. When I'm allocated a certain number of shipments, this is the old way of doing it. A truck came up here and and they were loaded up and went down there. Now we keep the same comms going with Carlsbad. And as soon as I have enough to make a shipment, the, the, the men and women who are in the computers making sure that all the requirements can be made and we've loaded as much waste, we used, we're not having any empty drums and things like that. They, they say, okay, the shipment's ready. They send a truck up here and it's gone. I don't have any shipments waiting in the cupboard, in the pantry waiting to go out. That was a change. That was in response to many levels, including environmental groups, citizens groups, the cab, elected officials, my regulators, <clears throat> making a point that New Mexico citizens gave a gift to the country in terms of WIP, and you better darn well prioritize the waste that's stored in New Mexico, that's currently resident in New Mexico, and going down to that plant. I am producing shipments and processing and characterizing waste as fast as I possibly can, and I've been asked many times by elected officials, could you do more with more money? And my, my answer is money is not my limitation right now. We've talked about labor and workforce. Uh, my regulators struggling to bring in and keep and retain highly qualified folks. We're having the same trouble at the deck plates with the operators, and I can only go at the speed of safety. So when elected officials ask, hey, if I gave you twice the budget, could, what could you do with it? My answer is the same, and I'd probably get it taken away because I'd have carryover. I hope that answered your question, Mark. Michael, thank you for that clarification. Yes, it does. Uh, 
Joseph, we'll get you in just a moment, but Keith, go ahead. Keith Grind, staff, and Mark, I just want to address your request for the WIP tour. Our staff is currently working on something in October, and so that's already a uh, path forward, and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we get more to let you know on. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Keith. Jose, please. Madam Chair, um, Ricardo, uh, thank you so much for um, beginning your introduction with a with a proper como la gente. That's in, that comes from the norte, and that is very appreciative. Uh, and I, I appreciate all the work that you've done on this this heavy duty uh, collaboration with between each other. <laughs> it's not as easy as some people think it is, but. Um, just stay focused, stand fast, and you'll, you'll, you'll get it done with each other. Um, I want to say something to Megan. Megan, estimada Megan. It is so cool that you, you brought up the issue about tribal consultation with, uh, with the New Mexico Environment Department. We only not only have one particular tribal nation that's having an issue with LANO, right? They're working together. But we have seven others in the Norte, in the northern part of the state. And across the state of New Mexico, we have 23. Um, it's so important on that tribal consultation and collaboration because most of the time when it comes with the, uh, the state of New Mexico, when, that, when Governor Bill Richardson came out with the, uh, um, in 2009, the, state, the, the bill to create the Tribal Consultation Collaboration Act, um, it wasn't easy for a lot of the tribes with just even on the state level. But now the word's getting out and um, it's working. I think it really is working. So muchas gracias, I appreciate that. And what else? I'm good. Madam Chair? Solid. Gracias, Jose. <laughs> Beverly, please. Um, I'd like to say as a member of the public and a member of the CAB, we're greatly concerned, well, maybe I should just speak for myself. I am greatly concerned about the, pl I, I understand it's a very complex issue. There's very uh, complicated negotiations going on. There's difference of um, viewpoints, but the concern is that the plume is moving while you guys are trying to figure this out. So we want to express our uh, appreciation for the process and w it, wish you could hurry it along because we're, con we're, we're concerned. The, the plume could be in Santa Fe, but in, you know, years from now when you guys come to uh, an agreement, and that concerns us. <laughs> Thank you, Beverly. Do, do we have any other members online who have a comment or a question for NMED? Okay. Seeing none, we're right on schedule. So now we will proceed with an update from EM Los Alamos office. Michael Michelinas, our field manager. Michael. Thank you, Elena. And good afternoon and welcome to members of the Citizens Advisory Board and public and in, at large and everybody who's attending virtually and in person with us today. Uh, I think I'd like to begin with uh, some personal news. Um, <clears throat> It is, you're probably likely aware the, the Department of Energy announced that last in December that I would be, I'm going to be transferred to manage another field office. Um, I'm <clears throat> I've been selected to, I'm gonna be in March, I'll be transferring to the Savannah River site to be the field office manager for the National Nuclear Security Administration's uh, operations at the Savannah River site. And later in October, uh, I'll be, uh, I'll be uh, in time between March and October, I'll be picking up the actions to uh, merge and become the landlord for the site. Much like NSA is the landlord, they operate the national lab here and I'm a tenant doing the cleanup mission. It's the reverse of Savannah River currently. The Office of Environmental Management is the landlord. They do the, they keep the roads and the bridges and the lights and steam and water going and they do the cleanup.
manager rather than a site office manager. And I'll have to take pauses at times as I talk. <clears throat> I had intended to be the, the field office manager here until I retired from federal service. This is a great job, it's a great mission. I've made, not only have I built working relationships with my regulator, with members of this board, with uh, environmental and citizens groups, uh, members of the public that come to my cleanup forums, I've built friendships and, relation, and deeper relationships. However, um, as my duty as an executive in the Department of Energy is to serve, and the agency has called upon me to, to serve in this new role. Um, I didn't seek out this job. Job kind of sought me. <laughs> but I view it as a recognition of what we've accomplished over the last two and a half years. We've made some very positive changes in terms of training. We've accomplished an awful lot. We've changed some things. We've brought our cleanup mission out of COVID, the shutdowns that were there, and started producing results, strengthening the programs, seasoning the workforce, delivering cleanup for the residents of New Mexico and the tribal nations that, that live around us. So <clears throat> it, it's, the recognition isn't about the cleanup, but it's about the other things that we've accomplished, the more intangible things, the, the, the relationship with my regulators, the improved um, nation to nation relationships that we we enjoy with the tribal nations uh, that that live around where we're clean we're doing the cleanup mission and the strategic vision engaging with the public that has been one of the biggest changes aside from the mission um, listening and acting on what we hear closer to your mic. oh I'm being told I'm talking not close enough to my mic apologies to everybody online who couldn't hear some of that um, this, this, what we've accomplished has come to the attention of the highest levels of the, of the Department of Energy. And that kind of change, that kind of leadership, that kind of effort is, is needed elsewhere in the department. So I can assure you when the decision was made to ask me to transfer, that the, the impacts and, and the needs here in New Mexico and the impacts of taking me out were, were balanced and considered against the impacts and the national defense mission and what I was needed to do in the next job that I'm gonna to go to. And, and I respect that decision. And that's why I said, absolutely, Madam Secretary, I, I serve at the pleasure of the secretary. I can always apply for jobs that I want to, but I never intended to apply for another job here. But as I've always told my staff, and I sometimes jokingly say here, I, I serve at the pleasure of the Secretary of Energy and the President of the United States as a senior executive. Never thought that would actually happen. It's quite an honor. Uh, but it also comes with significant, you know, mixed feelings of loss as I move on. <clears throat> I'm proud of what we've accomplished in the last two and a half years. And I am leaving a stronger organization behind me that embraces the values of transparency, public and stakeholder engagement, the respect that our the tribal nations, the sovereign nations that surround us deserve. And I, am, I have confidence, I don't make promises because the federal government usually doesn't do good with promises, but I have confidence that the team that I am leaving embraces the change that, that we have accomplished together with advice and consultation with this board, and that that change will continue, and it's not an artifact of personal leadership on my part anymore. We've made that change. My team has seen, my corporate partners have seen the benefits and what can be accomplished when we do that, and now it's not something I have to lead or point out. So I just wanted to share the news about moving on. It, it is a deep, I'll end with, I knew I'd been putting a lot of energy, time, and long hours into the job as a field office manager. I took the job very seriously, but it wasn't until um, I accepted and recognized that I, I was really needed out in another job by the secretary, and it started to hit home that I, I how emotionally invested I'd become. It's one thing to put a lot of time and invest a lot of your time and effort, and that's what I'm paid to do, right? 
the emotional investment really, really surprised me. And, and, and I'm bringing a part of New Mexico with me into the next job. It's, it, this, I did not expect um, it to grow in my heart the way it has. And I'm not selling my house here. I plan to come back. Um, I, I, I expected to retire from here, so I expect to retire from, uh, Los, from Savannah River as well. And who knows, maybe the secretary will move me again um, out here. That's not a promise, don't get anybody, so I'm just trying to encourage anybody. There are some pretty serious needs um, and challenges that she wants me to take on, the administrator and the secretary. Uh, but I will be back in New Mexico again, and I really look forward to, after finishing my service to the country, coming back here and seeing what the team that I'm leaving behind and what you as a board can do to help my team um, accomplish the cleanup mission. I, and, and my team, if y'all don't continue this, I'm gonna be one of the front row people in the next EM cleanup meeting after I retire, thumping my hand on the chair. <laughs> All right, enough with that. If I say, if I talk too much more about that, I'm gonna get all weepy eyed and, and, and I don't have any mascara on, but I, I look tear, terrible with tears in my eyes. Let me shift to um, some, some news of interest to this. and how on target they were, we're strengthening that process. The new website that uh, was asked about earlier would be a, a great way to rack up for your own reference and the members of the public that attend and watch these board meetings. Um, previous recommendations and how the Department of Energy responds to them. The, the, the uh, website will give us some transparency on that. Uh, there was a question earlier about whether or not, uh, you know, what's the status? Uh, I don't have any updates either, but we are very close to rolling it out. It, new websites and things like that undergo a uh, administrative review at headquarters right before they're released, and that's the point we're at right now. So I'm not, I'm hopeful, I'd really like to deliver it before I leave. Oh, by the way, my last day is, uh, I'm going backwards now, kind of not a linear person, am I? Um, my start date for the new job in, in uh, South Carolina is uh, March 24th. That's a Sunday, it begins at a pay period. March 25th, that Monday, is when my car will be packed up and I begin the drive eastward. You might ask, so what the heck, why, in, in, uh, in accepting this position it, in the Office of Environmental Management, knowing how impact of my, um, uh, my transfer will be uh, in, in the discussions with the Office of Secretary, NSA, uh, and the recognition of the impacts. EM asked for a, a 90 day transition from the day of the announcement. And that is to give me the time to accelerate some decisions I've been doing and making some changes over the last two and a half years. This next, now I have about 60 days left. We've identified critical decisions, needs, and issues that that a field office manager can make, institutionalize, or write down, because when you put an acting field office manager in place, uh, the, they'll make decisions, they'll keep the trains running, but the hard decisions, critical decisions, um, that's harder for an acting person to do. And then I get a new field office manager in place, and they're gonna, they're gonna study more closely until, right now I'm pretty comfortable doing my job and I know quite a bit about it, the next, farm, next field office manager is gonna need some time to get as comfortable as I am, so critical decisions will take longer. That can perturbate and cause, um, uh, slow things down and, often, and may even derail things. So that 90 day transition, my leadership in Washington DC recognizes how impactive this is and is ensuring that we have the time to try to find a, a replacement quicker before I leave, but the federal process and particularly at the executive level that's going to be a, that's a bit of a challenge, but they're ensuring that we have the time as a field office to identify those decisions, those critical needs, those critical issues, time to staff them up, make a decision, write it down and institutionalize it, and we've already made progress on some of those. I have about 10 pages of, of tables of different decisions, who's got the lead of it, and there are sub-decisions under that that we are managing on a twice a week basis, once a week with, with me to see how the progress is going. 
to, as a, to try to minimize that perturbation because I've heard from many folks who have had one-on-ones and how impactive this is and why is, why is the Department of Energy doing this? They don't care about, the Department of Energy does care about you. The Department of Energy absolutely understood the impacts. I made sure that they understood the impacts of this as part of making the decision at that level. Uh, but they balanced it against other needs. So I did want to share just, that was a long-winded way of going back to say, I'm departing on March 25th. Um, uh, so I mentioned the, this, this, the desktop guide and how we're gonna, we're gonna strengthen the, the CAD processes. And I'm really looking forward to getting the, the website in place because I remember my first meeting with the Citizens Advisory Board and I don't remember who the gentleman was off to my right at the table. We were in the uh, Cities of Gold um, and he, he mentioned how frustrated he was for years they had been asking for a website and why couldn't they have a website? And we listened and we built a website and populated a website. We used some of the more successful mo models that are out there. We beta tested it, I believe, with some of, some of the uh, board members and I would really like to still be here and, and celebrate with you when we get it in place and because I think it'll serve as we build it and mature it a uh, way for the, the board. It could be a, an information source for you to go back and look at in old presentations, new members coming up to, to look at in, in information data. And likewise, for the general public who want to see the meetings and know more about, we can post the bios and background of board members and history and things that are of interest. Be a great improvement. And I really hope we can get that in place before I leave. I want to celebrate with them. Am I still too far away again? Okay, I heard some talking about that. Oh, goodness, I'm, I'm, let me start eating the microphone. No, I'm just kidding. No. Yeah, the micro, they just said the microphone's moving by itself. It doesn't like the news that I'm sharing either. All right, well, let me turn to the hexavalent chromium plume. Uh, NMED provided an update. Uh, I'd like to start with the progress on how we're... we're how, you know, how we're making progress on the top environmental remediation project we have, which is the, the uh, hexavalent and chromium plume. Since the interim measure was shut down, we've conducted regular three-party meetings, technical meetings, between the Department of Energy and my corporate partners, New Mexico's Environment Department, and the Pueblo de San Alfonso to share our technical understanding of what's happening to the plume. We are in the planning for, as Ricardo mentioned, and in the process of obtaining permits for additional monitoring wells to acquire data necessary to characterize, further characterize the plume and design a remedy after NMED has selected a remedy. We are not at the, we have not submitted a, what is called a corrective measures evaluation under RECRA. We have gone quite a ways to be able to prepare that and would be ready to submit it, but we are not submitting it at this time. Additionally, we are, We've been working with Pueblo de San Alfonso on the details for a proposed second monitoring well on tribal lands. We're very close to, uh, we're in the process now of, of getting the final documents in place and expect to do um, mobilize in the field here uh, in early 2024, assuming everything continues to go on schedule. Both NMED and the Hazardous Materials Committee encouraged a third party review of the Chromium Interim Measure Project as Ricardo mentioned, and DOE supports this recommendation. Uh, EMLA, the Department of Energy, and NMED have engaged experts from the Network of National Laboratories. That's the uh, Savannah River um, lab that Ricardo mentioned. This is a, we're not engaging the lab itself, but rather we have a contract with the lab um, to, to, which can be used as a vehicle to bring in these, these world-renowned technical experts to give a, um, a thorough review of the issues uh, that, are, that are before us where we have differing professional opinions. <clears throat> the the uh, network of national laboratories uh, is a way to reach out to industry uh, we're in the Environmental Protection Agency and others to bring in that kind of expertise and then facilitate the technical discussions between um, the Department of Energy and our regulator to uh, resolve those differing opinions. I can share the review team will consist of 12 members with participation from the, that network of labs, industry, academia, and the Environmental Protection Agency in Region 6. The, the, uh, 
membership of this of this team is something that is jointly approved by both NMED and the Department of Energy. This is not the Department of Energy bringing a bunch of technical experts to the table to go do a review. This is something that at the highest levels within, within my field office and the New Mexico Environment Department have, we are, we are jointly working this, we are together, we are collaborating on bringing a technical review in, including the scope. It is a high priority for both DOE and the New Mexico Environment Department, although I do not speak for the New Mexico Environment Department. I'll just tell you as the federal agency, the applicant um, regulated, it is very evident to me that the, the Environment Department has taken this uh, very seriously and is a high priority as well to, res to use this team to resolve our differences. Um, <clears throat> we are in the process of working out the contracts for some of the individual team members. If they're not in the network of of national labs in the industry. Uh, they could be very quickly added to it. That's why the national lab was used as a contract vehicle to make all the money flow and get connected. EMLA is eager and working to move forward to bring in those world-class experts for the review, while at the same time resume at least a partial operation of the chromium in our measure while the review is, in, is, is ongoing. On the screen, I've, uh, I wanted to share the current status of the interim measure and why the Department of Energy and in my discussions with representatives from NMED, and I'm reluctant to say what that their take of these things, but I feel my regulator is just as concerned as the Department of Energy. I wanted to share what we're seeing. This, this is a just a single slide from a report that I pulled out, <clears throat> which depicts the plume, that little purple blob on the little on the map. And I've pulled out some uh, some graphs of chromium concentration over time, and I've got black arrows that point to each graph and where they are on the map that show, um, <clears throat> here's what's been happening to the chromium concentration over the years, the, the five years that we've been operating, the, uh, the interim measure has confined the plume and driven it back and reduced chromium concentrations. But the thing that has the Department of Energy concerned, and I believe New Mexico Environment Department concerned as well, and Beverly, this goes right to your point about uh, we need to do something about this right away. <clears throat> the interim measure had been controlling the chromium concentrations, but the, the little red line, to, dashed red line to the right of each of these graphs denotes the point at which the, the interim measure was shut down per regulatory direction. And we have been, as the data comes in, and we've been sharing this with our regular, that's why I'm sure I can say um, they are just as concerned about this as we are you can see the trends are the chromium concentrations are going back up again in the monitoring wells and extraction wells. This is just a few of them. There's about eight or nine of them that are, that are starting to grow. And the one that has me particularly concerned is in the lower left-hand corner of the, uh, the screen that you're seeing. That is R50, screen one. If you look at that on the map, it is the Sentinel well that is closest to the tribal lands, uh, the border with Pueblo de San Alfonso. And previously, we had, um, when the interim measure started operation, that was above 50 parts per billion and above the, uh, the regulatory limit. And the years of operation has steadily driven the concentration down, but now we're seeing it starting to come back up again. And that is the well that is closest to the tribal lands. And usually when I speak to the public, the regulator, um, my, my congressional uh, staff in, in, in D.C., uh, one of the accomplishments of the, of the interim measure that we've been able to achieve is pushing the plume edge, that 50 parts per billion. We, we had managed to push it back 500 feet from tribal lands over the, over the five, six years that it had been operating, and we're seeing some increases. So again, this is just data and sharing it. I, I felt this, we shared preliminary versions of this with the legislature last October. I only had a little bit of data. And now as more and more data comes in, we are sharing it real time. The, our regulator has access to this, but we are sharing it as well to make sure that they get it as quickly as we get it to see it. And I, and I felt as a part of the update, um, the Citizens Advis Advisory Board should, should see what we're seeing as well. We're, we're very concerned about those increases. You can take the, the, the photo down. I think I've scared everybody enough. My, my intention was not to scare anybody, by the way. There's no imminent hazard from this. 
It's not threatening a drinking water right now. My biggest concern from this is how close it is getting back to the, to the border that we have with Pueblo de San Alfonso. And it will be very, very difficult if the, if the plume begins to damage the aquifer under tribal lands, under a sovereign nation. And I have had frequent conversations with Governor McKino about that. It will be a game changer. So um, <clears throat> on, in September of last year, we received a proposal from the Environment Department to temporarily operate a portion of the interim measures with conditions. And after evaluating the proposal, EM, EMLA submitted a response in December requesting approval for partial resumption of the, <clears throat> of the chromium intermeasure. And we are awaiting uh, a response from the New Mexico Environment Department. I am hopeful that we can restart the interim measure operation soon, even if it's a partial operation. The, uh, we proposed resuming operation while the technical review team performs its work and evaluates the differing positions and make changes from that. Let me move on to another subject something maybe less depressing than that. Uh, I would like to address uh, some of Ricardo's points about the R76, the other wells. He brings up some very good points. We have had, um, there have been some recent changes within the, within the state to single screen versus dual screen, uh, shifting away from the use of bentonite as a seal. And, uh, and we are working through that to get the state all the information it needs. In the past, we have had some, I'll call it healthy debates over whether single screen or dual screen, concrete versus bentonite with their regulators. And I've recently personally become involved in that. And I just last two weeks ago met with the state engineer. And at the end of that conversation, the state engineer felt that we were, we were hitting a reset button in the relationship. We're not arguing over single screen and dual screen wells. We're not gonna argue over concrete unless it's an immediate um, <clears throat> uh, hazard that con using concrete changes the chromium concentration and, and it becomes a, 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 a non-conservative bias. We're gonna, we're gonna follow our regulatory direction. That's the change that I've been trying to make. And, and I've recently come to the realization and the engagement with the state engineer really helped to hammer it home that we can have dialogues over, okay, single screen versus dual screen, but we're not gonna do it in the permitting process. I've had regulatory direction. I'm gonna go follow regulatory direction. Yes, it'll mean twice as many wells, twice as much time, it slows down the progress, but I have a regulator and they give me direction. We're gonna go follow it. We're gonna try to reopen those windows. We're gonna, the, the state engineer is committed to having a dialogue outside the permitting process over, okay, what if additional information would we have to go get to revisit the conceptual model they have of the hydrological units that causes them concern from allowing us to use dual screen wells again. We've been doing dual screen wells for, many of the wells have that and done it successfully. But so what additional information would we have to go get? Let's not argue over whether it's adequate or not. Let's not go argue about bentonite or not. We'll go follow your direction but let's have a discussion to see what it would take to reopen the window or revisit it. What modeling, testing, in situ things could we do? That, that's how you get past the regulatory things. And frankly, it was a learning opportunity for the Department of Energy. And I think that's why I got the feeling from our state engineer that um, we were resetting the relationship. Again, going back to kind of my initial remarks about the changes and my job change, this is what I'm bringing to the table and my team is trying to drive. There was, the, the state engineer did um, share R80. We proposed a dual screen well. We did that because we thought we understood the hydrological units and the limitations. We thought we were within the exceptions that they had for allowing us to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the senior members of the, of the state engineer staff said that they, they probably didn't do as good a job as they could of communicating what those limitations were. That's why we, uh, I intentionally didn't want to fight on the dual screen wells, but I certainly set that appearance of it. And I told the state engineer, I'm sorry if that's what it appeared to be. We thought we were actually following your guidance and trying to do it as efficiently as we, we could. So long discussion about, uh, about R79 and 80 and 76. Um, we are working to get the state the information they need that R76 is drilled all the way to depth. 
We just need to put the well in, and we need to get the state the information they've asked for, and we are working very hard to go get it. That is on us. It is our action to go do that. But I thought I would share the resetting of the relationship or the efforts that we are making to try to reset that relationship with our state engineer, because not only should have I been trying to reset my relationship with my environmental department regulator, I also need to make sure that we are clearly communicating, particularly in light of some of the changes that occurred with our state engineer regulator as well just as important. Let me finish my remarks and we'll go to questions. I'm rather long-winded at times and the first part of this discussion has been a pretty hard one for me. I want to finish on a, on a bright point, the strategic vision. We've talked about this quite a bit and I'd like to close with that a little bit. Throughout the phase one, the educational sessions and the phase two, the listening sessions, we obtained significant feedback through the, um, the engagement that we've had. And we learned a lot about what the board here, uh, environmental and citizens groups, elected leaders, members of the public, the tribal nations felt were the values and the uh, priorities in, in doing the cleanup mission. I, I did not ask people to tell me how to do it. Uh, that's my job. I asked people to tell me what's important to you, what is a value, what, what do you want to be done, and that's what we're listening to, and we're building that into phase three. We met with uh, over, over 170 groups and participants who, who represented 20 stakeholder and Pueblo groups. And over, this, over a series of about 30 or so meetings, we received more than 2,000 comments that we are in the process of, of analyzing, grouping. We're putting it into a, a model called Socrates that helps us make the decisions. Uh, and we're preparing for, for phase three, where I do the, as I've called it, the fishbowl. As a component of the transition that I talked about, phase three will not occur before March 25th, I can promise you that. Um, but I was asked in the, one of the very earliest meetings by a member of, the, of an environmental group that came to the table, and, you know, they came to the table with what I feel would be a healthy dose of skepticism, and they asked point blank, is, are we seriously going to reconsider everything, anything? And I told them, everything is on the table, including the enabling assumptions that we've had for cap and cover on material disposal areas, things like that. That's why we're listening. Otherwise, I'm wasting your time and mine. So some of those decisions I'm accelerating right now, we've, we are pulling that. Those are part of the critical decisions. There are guiding principles, revisiting some of the enabling assumptions or decisions that might, be made, might need to be made based on the information that we received in those phase one and twos. We are pulling those up in time so that I can make decisions on them, get them written down, and they'll be used then for the, for the guiding principles. I intend to honor my commitment to make as many of those decisions and revisit it that we made as we did the, the uh, initial engagements. I, we will do the phase three as quickly as we can this year. And I, I really, I will to be tuned, if I'm not on the stage, because I think it'll happen after March 25th, I have a great team that's going to be able to do it, a corporate partner that, uh, um, that has demonstrated they could do that when we did something similar for awarding the first option period under the contract. I know I've got a model that will make this work in how we would present it and do this work in front of the public. And I will probably be sitting in the virtual audience when phase, when phase three occurs because I'm going to watch what my team is doing and make a public comment. If, well, can I make a public comment if I'm still a federal official? I have to see about that. Um, but anyway, um, and then phase four ha will happen when, when after we finish that, putting together a, a conceptual vision in front of the public, we go back and touch some of the key groups, the, the Pueblos, my regulator headquarters, as we finalize the strategic vision. So we've made a lot of progress on that. We're accelerating some of the decisions so that I get to make those decisions. I've been involved in it the whole way. I've heard a lot of the feedback. I wanna accelerate as much of that as we can so that some of those critical decisions are made to honor the commitment that I had to personally make sometimes in these meetings that yes, this is a serious effort. And um, with that, I think that's all the all the prepared and in some cases unprepared remarks that I wanted to make for the group, and I'm here for any questions. Please don't make me cry. <laughs> oh, then maybe I shouldn't go next. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Thank you for the update, Michael, and uh, thank you for your leadership. It has been a remarkable change 
and uh, I know you, you have an excellent team, and they will carry that forward. That we will steward this work that we've all that we've we've begun to work together to build together, and uh, you're an integral part of that. And you're so appreciated, and you'll be dearly missed. Members, I see Anne. Okay, well, Michael, I couldn't have to, might have to challenge you a little bit on this one and just say um, thank you so very much. Um, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to engage with you probably more than many of the people on the cab just because of being up in Los Alamos. And um, you've brought a lot of heart to your work and you demonstrate through your actions that caring is very important in what we do even when it's um, difficult work, even if it's challenging work, even if it's bad news. So thank you for all the heart you put into it, and we're gonna miss you, and um, hope you stay in touch. And as someone who left Los Alamos once and found it much harder than I thought it was, um, I came back, so um, don't, don't knock it. It's, it's not a bad thing to come back to as well. My house is within walking distance of, of Ashley Pond where the summer concert series is. I will be back for some of those summer, those summer concerts are amazing. I've never seen anything like that in any of the other towns I've lived in. It is a beautiful aspect of a, of a community event in the summer. I will be back for those. I'm gonna to go to the Pueblo feast days. I have invitations for those. And one of the things I've learned is when you've been invited to a feast day, it's a lifetime invitation to come break bread at, at the, um, the uh, members, the people's house that have invited you over, and you're, it's a lifetime invitation unless you do something to get uninvited, and I don't intend to get uninvited. I, I really look forward to coming back. Well, again, I just um, thank you for your service, but I thank you for being a community member, and uh, we'll welcome you back when you come back. Thank you, Ann. Mark? Thank you, Madam Chair. M Michael, thank you for your personal relationship building. I, I appreciate the conversations and the getting to know you better, and yes, you will be missed. Um, also, thank you for your transparency. I think it was very appreciated. Um, I'll speak on behalf of the group, but mostly myself. The thing that I was hoping to hear about your review of the chromium plume was the link between the injection piece and the ultimate remediation. Um, I didn't hear a lot about that, unless I missed it, but I know that work plan item number five is the groundwater modeling as a tool to support remediation discussion making. And in that is uh, the, the background purpose is the, the, the numerical coding to examine probable outcomes of various groundwater remediation alternatives and to inform decision making and a comparison of relevant groundwater models such as FEHM and MODFLOW. And mod flow and FEHM. Mod is. flow in a word, correct. So maybe if you can, uh, comment on, on how the uh, injection well approach is working and whether or not these groundwater modeling flows will impact that decision. Thank you. Uh, boy, Mark, you didn't throw me a softball on that one, did you? <laughs> uh, so it's been a while since I looked at the work plan. You're, you're reading from the work plan that we submitted to the state um, yes. in 2022, I believe. Um, the, that, that particular item in the work plan, this, this was written pre-regulatory direction to cease injection altogether. It, prior to that, the state had been expressing some concerns with the interim measure operation, in particular the injection, and wanted us to be looking at different ways of operating the system, including the uh, an alternative injection site that uh, Ricardo mentioned in his earlier comments. And that action was put into the plan, um, and we were together at, at one point until the regulatory direction came in. There was to it was a commitment by the department to sit down and kind of what if, how would we what should we do differently? How should we operate the injection system and re extraction system? If we could put the the screen up, put that back up, um, we were going to look at different options. And but the regulatory direction changes that, and and that's not a criticism. It's 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 what happened. 
an example of how we might have explored something actually comes out of what is happening here. If you look at the lower right-hand side of what's on the screen, that is R45 screen two. And you'll see that it is, the arrow draws it back right to the lower right-hand side of the plume. At the, it would have been steadily increasing. That was something of concern to both uh, the Environment Department and the Department of Energy. But when we shut down about 60% of the interim measure, which included three of the injection wells, and the three injection well because of electrical issues, and we never resumed them. That's kind of where you see that slope going back down again. The, when we shut down the injection wells, and you'll probably have a hard time seeing it from the map here, but there's two injection wells right up there by Crex 5. You see the, yeah, right there at the top. Crex 5 is the graph at the top. We shut down those injection wells, but Crex 5 kept operating. And what we think is probably happening in, by the data showing here is that by continuing to operate Crex 5, but not the two injection wells, we started to pull the plume up to Crex 5. And that's why you see the decrease in the lower screen. Um, the purpose of that particular item in the work plan prior to the shutdown was let's get together and hypothesize different ways of operating it without the, we wouldn't have had this data to see, okay, what, what can we do as a test instead of running five injection, five extractions to go mix it up a little bit? We didn't want to do a drastic change because, and I use this analogy because I think we can all imagine it. If you're trying to understand maybe what's happening under the surface of a pond, you throw a rock in there and watch the wave, and if it's shallow, it kind of grows a little bit like a tsunami. You can see what, you can get some ideas of what's happening by the ripple of the wave. But if you throw a handful of rocks in the, in, the, in the pond, there's so many ripples that overlap and interfere with each other, you can't figure out which rock or what cause made a change. Unfortunately, we've made a couple changes very quickly, 60% shutdown and then the full shutdown. We're gonna have to try to fare through all those ripples moving forward, but the specific work item there was the precursor to where we find ourselves today of let's go sit down in a, in a proposal by the department and the work plan to brainstorm a, a, a different way of operating the interim measure to address the state's concerns before the state became concerned enough to provide regulatory direction. Again, that's not criticism of it. It takes time to put together a work plan. That's what we had agreed to, but, and I don't speak for the, the state, I feel that the state became concerned enough that they couldn't wait for that part of the work plan to come and they chose to take they chose to take regulatory direction and, and hence where we are. So the thing that you're reading from, I believe from my perspective, is an outdated work plan um, proposal because the, the uh, regulatory shutdown and where we are, the, the regulatory directed shutdown and where we are now makes that overcome by events. We're still gonna have to do something like that coming out of the technical review, the expert technical review that's gonna go on because they're gonna look at all this, they're gonna to try to help bring, they're gonna bring all their vast experience and knowledge to help us fare through all this and, and give us some, some thoughts and recommendations to move forward. But specifically answering that part of the work plan um, is overcome by events. I hope I answered your question. If not, rephrase it and I'll try to answer it again. You, you have, except for, our, is injection still on the table? Injection, thank you for the question. Injection has to be on the table. I don't have an alternative location for it. It takes time to do that. And for the, all the reasons I've, I'm not gonna rehash them because frankly, um, it becomes tedious for people to hear the same arguments again. And it could be, I, I do not wanna provoke my regulator because we're actually working together. And to go back and argue about injection or not injection in the plume route, the fact is even in the proposal the state gave us to, to resume in, in, in September, we still would have been injecting into the plume. So injection is gonna be necessary because I cannot operate, I cannot surface this uh, dispose of the water. It, it, in, it, even if I did land application in the most optimal way, I could run one extraction well 50% of the time. Not effective, it won't, it won't change things at all. So rather than provoking my regulator and rehashing things that will get citizens groups, environmental groups, the public, and maybe you annoyed, that's, that's whether, yes, we'll have to do injection, whether we do something somewhere else or not, that's what the technical, expert technical review is gonna be. The Department of Energy and NMED jointly worked 
the, the scope that we're gonna charge that team to, to review. We are in consensus. This is, this is progress, okay? Remember, we, for many months, we had, been, we, had, we had had differing opinions and we were polarizing. This gets back to the point that Beverly was making. If we continue to do that, it'd be analogous to, Ro to the Emperor Nero fiddling on the roof of Rome while it burns around them. NMED and Department of Energy recognizes that. And in October, when it was suggested, hey, why don't you go do a, why don't you bring in some experts to come in here and help advise you to figure out the differing opinions? We've been working on that. We've been working out together. It took me longer to reply to the September 6th letter from NMED because I didn't want to waste time penning the response. I already accepted their recommendation. Let's get a, in a, let's get a, a technical review going on. And I was working with Rick Sheehan and, and John Roderick to, to propose a, a, a way to do this, one that is kind of a, 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 a gold standard practice for evaluating independently construction projects, and we are adapting it to this. NMED reviewed it, thought about it, and we've been jointly working to agree on the approach, agree on the scope, and bring members that we feel are, are, have an independent perspective and have the right level of expertise to fare through the things that we've had differing opinions on. This gets right to the heart of how much longer are you gonna go do this? And I, I would have characterized some of what Ricardo said a little bit differently, and I think I did it in mind. There's a lot more joint things going on in this, in this technical review. Yes, we've been polarized on this. We're really concerned about the data, but the two agencies, you as citizens should be looking at why is the government, why isn't the government doing something? I think that's the point you're making. We are, and we have asked the state um, to consider allowing us to resume at least partial operation of the intermeasure. I mean, look at what it was doing to screen two when I was able to operate CREX five without the injection wells. I would welcome the opportunity to sit down with the state kind of very quickly, okay, what do we, like the work plan item that you just mentioned, five. Okay, what can we do for in, to operate it to try to turn around some of those rising things address the issue in, in screen two again, to try to find something we can do in the interim while the experts come in and look at this. Hopefully, now I got, gave you a little bit better and on target response. Thank you, I'll let somebody else lobby a softball. <laughs> Michael? Yes. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. <laughs> this is Steve McLaughlin. Um, I wanted to echo you, everyone's both congratulations and thanks for your efforts, um, especially with respect to the pending institutionalization, as you might call it, of the critical decisions which you're working on, because that will certainly expedite things going forward and, and minimize, hopefully, the potential delays that could come from this kind of a transfer. Um, so I really appreciate that effort on your behalf, on your part. Um, I had one obvious screwball little technical question since I'm a relative newbie. Um, on the chromium chart, um, I'm assuming all the dots are wells of some kind? All the dots are period, are the, the, each graph is a well, and the dots are a uh, chromium concentration at a particular date. So if you look at the lower one for um, R50, that that shows you a, a uh, timeline, a time history, if you will, starting all the way back in January of 2018, about the time the interim measure began operation. And, right. and as you go to the right, it goes all the way to January of 2024. There's a time lag in getting samples back from the lab. It, it takes about a month to get the sample, package it, ship it, get the QA results back. But it's just, these, these are all chromium concentrations at a single um, point on the map, a single well. Over over a period of about six years. Okay. On the on the map itself, the CREXs are extraction wells. The yes, CRINs sir. are injection wells. Yes, sir. What are the PZs? Oh, the CRPZs. I'll I'll look to my my. Uh, I forget what the name. The other wells there are generally monitoring wells. The the acronyms for PZ and and others. Pesometers, it it, it yeah. is a, it is a technical artifact that probably 
I will, I, I, at the risk of having a couple cab members' foreheads slam into the desk when I put them to sleep, if we, if I actually brought the people who know enough to talk about it, it they, uh, let's just say those are all groundwater monitoring well points. They, they do a little bit more than just grabbing the data. You can get water levels and things like that out of them. But if it's not an injection or extraction well, consider it for very simplistically, it's a monitoring well. And that's what all the R's are, monitoring wells? Yes, sir. Some of them may be regional versus, a, again, this all gets back into the nomenclature of how administratively we manage um, the environmental monitoring on the site. But yes, they're all monitoring wells. Do you have a feel for when you're pumping water into an injection well, what the, the area of its impact it is. I mean, how far does it spread from the whale, the whale head or the, the bottom of what would be the inverted well head? Uh, yes, sir, we do. We have a better understanding of the, um, of the zone of influence, the zone of capture, if you will, both vertical and horizontal at the extraction wells. We have estimates of that for injection, I believe, but let me, let me take an action on the last one because I, I know I've had uh, discussions and I've seen calculations on zone of captures for extraction wells. I haven't had that dialogue if we know about the zone of influence, if you will, when you inject it both vertically and horizontally. Let me take that for an action rather than speaking off the top of my head and we'll address that at the next cap meeting. I would appreciate that because it obviously has to do with how many wells and how far apart they are. <laughs> one one art interesting artifact, the, the point of the injection and extraction as a um, as a means, as an inner measure to confine the plume on the site, was that if you imagine, you know, you're using extraction wells to suck up water and you're injecting it and you're trying to reverse the flow nominally. Right. It, in some cases, we injected dot when we injected dyes into the injection wells, we actually found traces of the dye in the extraction wells, which shows that hey, you know, I've actually reversed the flow. Right. That didn't always happen in some injection wells. Where it didn't. It wasn't found in the extraction wells, but that doesn't mean that the hydraulic barrier wasn't working. Because even if you can slow down the groundwater, your capture zone will grow much bigger. If you think about it, like your Hoover vacuum, you know, when the when the husband is when, when okay, let's not be too offensive here. When I'm <laughs> vacuuming. The, uh, the, the rug in, in, in my house and the missus is watching me, I'm running that vacuum cleaner as fast as I can because I'm, I'm tired of the chore. If I'm not running it over the dirt for very long, I'm not pulling much out of the carpet, right? But if I go real, real slow, the, the, um, the brushes have a chance to go sucking things out. It's the same thing with groundwater. If you slow the groundwater movement past the, the extraction well suction, it has longer, more time to go impact the water moving past it and you can bring your, your, your zone of capture, if you will, grows. So even if I can't hydraulically reverse the flow of groundwater underneath, in, in, you know, 1,000 feet below the ground, if I can slow it down enough, it makes those capture zones get bigger and the extraction wells that we have in place overlap and they protect, they keep the new high contaminants from getting through and we're basically holding it on site while, the, while we move to a remedy. So that's what the, I don't have a good answer for you for the injection zone of influence, but I do know they've had in some cases direct communication and in others, it's a good question. I'm gonna go back and look at what's the zone of influence estimated to be and how close were they? At least we're slowing it down. Great, thank you very much, Michael. And now I'll caveat it that that is the Department of Energy's perspective. I'm not, I, in everything I've talked about with the path forward and moving forward, on the expert team, et cetera, th that is a joint message from both the environment department perspective, I should say, my field office, and we ensure that the Pueblo de San Alfonso understands it because as we communicate on the expert team and what we're doing moving forward, we are sending a joint message because we are jointly working and collaborating as best you can collaborate with the regulator. Um, so all that messaging is a joint and collaborative messaging. What I just shared with you on what's happening under the ground, I, I'm coming as close as I'm getting, gonna have, go in this discussion to the device of differing opinions that led up to the more collaborative independent technical review. I, I won't say whether my, my regulator agrees or shares that perspective or to what, ex perspective, or to what extent they would or would not. 
And I assume the technical team will be looking at all these issues as well? Yes, sir. Absolutely. This is the heart of the differing professional opinion of the effectiveness of the interim measure and things like that. The technical team is being charged to look at this. Issues of interest to both DOE and NMED. Excellent. Again, my thanks and best wishes on your new position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Michael, for that explanation. I appreciate it. We're going to have two more questions. We have one from Jose, and then we'll follow up with Neelam, and then we'll move on with our agenda. Madam Chair, uh, Michael, thank you. I understand it. Believe me. <laughs> Everything you've said, um, it's been a learning curve since I came on board um, with the cab um, from a community perspective. And I have no idea what a plume was that went under the aquifer. I know what plumes do up there in the sky, but down in the bottom, I understand everything you're talking about. And so it helps me to better grasp on my own knowledge about what Lano has done and what the, the projects that you guys are doing, and I appreciate that. And Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Jose. Neelam. Yeah, I just wanted to say as a regulator, Michael, you didn't provoke me, but I do feel like I need to respond to some of the stuff you said. I do take exception to the fact that you wanted us to sit around the table and discuss it. We have spent over two years having these annual technical meetings, and I do hope we collaborate and move forward. I do agree that NMED and DOE wants to take care of the plume and remove the contamination. But we did. The reason we gave direction was because we felt we weren't being heard. We've been saying for a long time, I see the charts you're projecting, and that is the true data. But we have cons consistently said that extract, we do believe the extraction part of the IM works. It's the injection at the location where we are look injecting does not work. So we've been asking for alternate injection locations, which we still don't have any. We do not have an injection well outside the plume, which we've been asking for over two years. We put a milestone, which was a IM work plan, and we didn't get an alternate injection location in that too. So from NMED's perspective, which hopefully this independent panel we are going to get is going to help us resolve. Maybe we wouldn't be seeing these spikes if we were extracting and injecting somewhere else. I understand you can't inject on the ground right now, but if you, I feel, had listened to NMED and made an effort to come up with injections in alternate locations, maybe we wouldn't be seeing these spikes. And I'll leave it up to the expert panels. I'm not a hydrogeologist to respond, but I'm not provoked, but I did feel I needed to provide some clarification on what you said. Thank you, Neelam. Thank you, Neelam. And uh, yes, the, the CAB and the Risk Evaluation and Management Subcommittee did submit a recommendation, right, and submitted a recommendation on the chromium plume. And we agree that the interim measure of extract, treat, and inject has been beneficial. However, we also agree that injection should be in a different area of the plume, and that is in our recommendation. So, thank you. And now, and now we have a very special presentation for a very special person. <laughs> oh, I don't want to make cry or anyone else cry, but uh, feel free to let the tears flow. Um, we do disagree sometimes, and uh, it's it's because we all care about this project so much. And and again, Michael has brought so much heart to, to this project, and we are so grateful to have him. Things have changed remarkably under him, and um, I can't. I don't know if I can say any more. Would anyone else like to say a few words? And well. Or are we all, we're all very choked up. Beverly? 
if I could say it without emotion, but we really appreciate your approach to things, your the way you listen, the way you answer questions. It's it, it's really uh, refreshing, and um, it's been very much appreciated. We 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 really we really are going to miss you. We really appreciate you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, then Bridget, Manise. Yolanda, or just me, Keith. Keith and Brad. We have something for Michael. Okay, welcome back to everyone in the room. And those who are not in the room, welcome back as soon as you get back. Welcome back to everybody online. And now we have a speaker, Kevin Reed, will give his presentation on landfill covers their purpose and performance. Kevin, please. Thank you. <coughs> All right, thank you, Elena. Uh, my name is Kevin Reed, and I've had the pleasure to participate in the CAB meetings on a couple of different occasions. Could you turn on your microphone, please? Oh, is it? All right, I'll start over. Uh, my name is Kevin Reed, and, and I've had the pleasure to participate in a couple different CAB meetings with you all. I've previously spoke about, uh, specifically about MDAH and the uh, corrective measures evaluation that we proposed for that site. I've also given an overview of, of MDAs in general, material disposal areas in general at Los Alamos. Uh, today, I'm gonna speak talk not about a specific site or a specific uh, location at Los Alamos, but just about a feature of the disposal areas. And, and that feature is the cover or the engineered cover for landfills. And so this can be applicable to any site or any place where waste is stored. And so my background is in geology and hydrology. I've worked up at Los Alamos for over 20 years, and currently I'm supporting N3B's environmental remediation program. So I'm, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to uh, present content on, on landfill covers. So I, I, I've, today's been a pretty uh, big day. I've participated in the meeting, and, and there's been a really quite a bit of content. So I just want to take advantage of everyone's uh, cake buzz and cake high. And uh, there's really just three things I would like you all to remember from this presentation today. And number one, the, the, the purpose of, of landfill covers are to isolate waste from the environment and from people. So that's the number one role of a landfill cover. And the second part of my presentation, I'm going to present a quite a bit of <clears throat> research and previous studies that have undergone in development of how landfill covers are designed and, and where they're applicable. And the third part of my presentation is gonna be about what makes a really good uh, landfill cover and, and why in particular evapotranspiration covers are very well suited for a semi-arid environment. So real quick, the three things. Landfill covers isolate waste from people in the environment. There's been a ton of research and development and uh, studies that have been undertaken to study this and optimize landfill covers. And for our, the third point, for our environment, semi-environment, uh, an evapotranspiration cover is really optimal. So, uh, let's see. So this presentation, some of these slides and some of this information was previously presented to the CAB in 2022. So for those of you who have been part of the CAB since 2022, some of this may be a, a, a repeat, but um, it's a very important topic. And so I think it it's worthy of additional conversation and uh, discussion. So landfill covers are really... Um, well, they can be used anywhere in the United States, and they're used, to, as I mentioned, to isolate waste from people and the environment. And they are applicable for uh, the material disposal areas at Los Alamos. 
So I did discuss what the, the main goals of my talk are, are today, but uh, the brief outline is um, we'll talk about uh, as an introduction to where landfill covers could be applied at Los Alamos is certainly they can be applied to the material disposal areas. And we'll talk about what is a cover and why are covers used and where else they're, they're used in the United States. And some of the research that has gone on to develop the prescription for the type of landfill covers that are implemented. And then we'll highlight uh, an evapotranspiration cover that's been installed at the Los Alamos Airport landfill. All right, so uh, previous uh, meetings I've been to, we've talked about material disposal areas, but I'll just reiterate that the, in general terms, material disposal areas are, are sites where buried materials that may contain hazardous or radiologic constituents are stored. So at, at Los Alamos, both uh, radioactive and hazardous materials were disposed at, at MDAs beginning in 1945 and actually through present day. In total, there's 26 MDAs throughout Los Alamos, uh, and they're located throughout the laboratory. And our program is concentrates on all 26 of those, those MDAs, but in particular, there are seven that are our principal MDAs that we are actively, uh, are actively in the consent order process and are under remediation. Okay. So one option for closure of a, a contaminated area is a landfill cover. And, uh, and so once the cover's installed, the engineered cover will isolate the buried waste. And it's not just installation of the cover, but there is follow-on work to continue to monitor the effectiveness of that. So that the, the additional work, and we are conducting that work at the airport landfill, includes quarterly inspections of the landfill cover and ensuring that all the controls are in place and functioning correctly, as well as we'll do periodic in inspections based on precipitation events. So if there's a precipitation trigger, in the case of the airport landfill, it's greater than one inch in an hour would trigger an, uh, an inspection. So other options for uh, site closure or remediation include insight immobilization of the waste, targeted removal of buried waste, and complete removal of, of waste. But again, as I, I pointed out at the very beginning of my talk, the, the point of, of a cover is to isolate the underlying waste and reduce risk to human health and the environment. So that, that was step one, or, or point one of the, the talk. Okay, so in terms of definitions, a landfill cover is an engineered system consisting of multiple layers, and we'll go through some slides and I'll, I'll show you diagrams of, of thicknesses and, and illustrations of how these covers are constructed. And really, the goal of the, the landfill covers are to isolate the waste, and, and we've, we've stressed that. And so in terms of isolating, you're really preventing water from infiltrating into the waste and potentially mobilizing contamination, contaminants deeper. And you're also preventing intrusion by either people, plants, or animals. And the other part of the cover, it has to withstand erosion by both water, as we talked about rainfall or runoff, and wind erosion as well. And the other feature of a of landfill cover is that it has to last for a long duration and meet the regulatory standards for protectiveness. So as I mentioned, uh, the landfill cover can, it consists of, this, these are two diagrams of, uh, well, of what the, the composition of the landfill cover would be. So on, on the left 
is uh, what we're, we're terming more of a traditional prescriptive cover. And on the right is a, a more recent design or uh, alternate cover, uh, evapotranspiration cover. So that the main features of, of both of these are is, is basically to, to restrict the flux of water that goes or the infiltration of water that goes down into the waste material. So the waste material in this case is on the bottom. We have the existing cover on top of the waste material for, for both of these. And then the difference of these, this prescriptive cover is that it relies on a, a compacted clay layer. So uh, a, a two foot thick layer of clay to prevent the, the vertical infiltration or the downward infiltration of water into the waste material. So that's what the design is, is by having an impermeable barrier, it restricts the vertical flow of water into the waste. So uh, alternatively, and, and we'll get into very many details about the evapotranspiration cover, is, is consists of just at least three feet of soil over the top and at least six inches or, or a foot of a surface treatment. And the surface treatment is just composed of uh, topsoil and gravel. And really, I mean, what, what is was elegant about the evapotranspiration cover is the simplicity. Uh, there's only two layers and it consists of, of native materials, soils and native vegetation that, that grow on the site. And really, it's it's um, there's nothing fancy about it. It's it's uh, it's a soil horizon, and then it's a soil and a gravel horizon. So some of the things that are, are difficult of this uh, clay layer and geomembrane, um, or I should back up a little bit. A geomembrane is a a layer of a, a man-made substance. It can be plastic or uh, polyethylene that basically acts as a layer between the, the different horizons and, and prevents infiltration and also encourages the stability of, of the layers and, and no mixing between the layers. So it, it isolates the compacted clay layer from the soil drainage layer and the surface rock and, at, and uh, soil mixture. So one of the vulnerabilities, in, in, particularly in dry climates, is this clay. And if anybody's been outside or, um, well, of course we've all been outside, but after rainstorms, there's mud puddles, mud puddles will dry up and there'll be a, a, a clay film that's on the bottom of a mud puddle. And then as that, that water continues to dry more and more, the clay shrinks and cracks. And so that's, that's, a, that's just a vulnerability of using clay as, as one of the horizons is because it can, it can dry severely and, and produce cracks. And once, once it cracks, then that prevents this sealing layer. In contrast to the, the evapotranspiration uh, layer, behaves more like a, a sponge where it'll absorb water into it and then the plants will use the water and the, the sun will evaporate the water. So those are, those are two kind of main differences between uh, uh, the prescriptive covers and the evapotranspiration covers. And I just want to talk a little bit more about the, this, this term evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration is, is, a, is a word that's a combined word. So it's a, it's a combined word of evaporation and transpiration. So uh, it's, it's referred to as evapotranspiration or it's abbreviated as ET. So sometimes you'll hear ET cover or ET barrier, um, which refers to evapotranspiration barrier. So the, the processes are, you have precipitation, so you have water rainfall falling onto the surface and the water can infiltrate into the soil and or it can, and once it's in the soil, it can evaporate through the sun and, and that's turning liquid water into gas water uh, and it evaporates. Or transpiration is the process of plant uptake of liquid water by the roots and then uh, turning 
liquid water into gaseous phase. So, so basically this is a cycling of, of precipitation into the cover and then out of the cover through these two processes, transpiration and evaporation. And, and we'll get into more discussion about uh, evapotranspiration covers, particularly when we talk about the airport landfill cover. So landfill covers are, are widely deployed to isolate all types of waste. Um, municipal waste that you would get at your landfill, your county landfill, hazardous waste that you'd have at a permitted receiving facility, or low-level radioactive waste, which would be, at a, again, at a permitted disposal facility. They've used, been used at uh, various Superfund sites and many cleanup sites throughout the country um, and uh, across the country, not only in, in uh, semi-arid environments, but also at many other states in the United States. So I'll just go through a couple quick examples. Um, so these are, are fully functional evapotranspiration covers, and this one is located in it's a uranium mine closure in San Mateo, New Mexico. You can see the construction of this, the cap, and then this is the current cap, and well, not too current, in 2018. But basically, you have native vegetation, primarily grasses and forbs, which, which repopulate the cover and function to evaporate and transpire the water out of the cover. Covers have also been used at the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal in Colorado. This is showing the construction, and you can see the multi-layer aspect of these covers. This would be the, the lower uh, gravel layer followed by a, a fine sand and a soil layer. And so basically, these, these another key feature of the evapotranspiration covers are to have a soil horizon that is with uh, essential nutrients for plants, so nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, for growing healthy plants, which maintain the integrity of the cover, and, and as well as producing the long-lasting effects of the, the surface protection. This is a third site in southern Arizona, a super fun site. So you can see an aerial photo of during construction of, of quite a large area where this, this cover was installed. And, and as part of the monitoring of these locations, there is moisture probes and documentation of, of how to measure uh, the infiltration of moisture. But in these climates, this, all these, this vegetation basically takes all the soil, all the, the moisture that is infiltrated into the cover and uses it for plant growth and also transpires it back into the environment. The fourth site is near Farmington, also a super fun site. And you can see a, a similar pattern. Um, these are all semi-arid locations, and you can see the, the native vegetation reoccupying and, and growing on top of these uh, covers. Kevin? Yes. Can we, just a moment, I apologize to interrupt you. For interrupting you, we have a hard stop for public comment right now. Oh, sure. And I figured this would be a good okay. moment. Um, Bridget, we don't have anybody signed in at the desk. Is there anybody online who would like to provide public comment? Scott? We'll give him a moment to unmute. Scott, we're having trouble hearing you. Yeah, I'm not getting 
Sorry. So what we can do is you can submit your public comment to the CAB office. Email that to Bridget. Thank you. I appreciate that. I apologize. Madam Chair, yeah. can, he, can he phone in with the phone? Can, you, you, can he use his phone to call in? He, he could, but Scott is indicating no. No? Okay. No, he'll, he'll write in. Is that correct, Scott? Thank you. Yes, Beverly? Oh, wait. Just, just a second. I want to see if there's anyone else who has public comment, then we'll spin off. Apologize. Anybody else who has public comment? Do you see anybody? Okay. We are seeing nobody online other than Scott. And I apologize again, Scott. Um, Kevin, is it okay to take questions now? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and then I we'll move forward. I encourage questions because it throughout. If I just keep talking, then I'll, people start okay. going to sleep. So, and if, if um, other people are talking, they're not sleeping. You it's could good. alter your mic just a little bit so we could hear you better. Yep. Especially the people online. Okay, Beverly. So, with these covers and the natural vegetation, have, are you aware of any issues with the, the roots of the plants getting so long that they reach the contamination and bring it up? Um, we, that issue happened in Bio Canyon. We had an issue with the chamisa bringing contamination up. It wasn't a cap, it was a different situation. Yeah. No, that, that's a really good point. So part of the inspections that we have is, is to make sure that there's no woody vegetation occupying those covers. So. I, I'm aware as well with the chamisa is very deep rooted and then does uptake radionuclides. So we would, as part of the inspections, just ensure there's no uh, occupation or, or, or emergence of pinions or junipers or, or tree or woody species, including chamisa. The ideal vegetation type is our grasses and, and forbs for basically maintaining an establishment. They protect the surface from erosion. When it does rain, then they, they come back alive and they uh, uptake the water and transpire. And particularly the native, like uh, buffalo or blue grama grass is, is super hardy and, and um, resilient to drought. And because that's the experiences that we have in some arid environments where we'll have long periods of of no precipitation, followed by really intense storms. And so, so the thickness of this cover absorbs all that water. And then over time, you know, during these, these dry periods, that water is extracted from the soil horizon by the plants and by evaporation. But one of the, the things that we do uh, mind is the woody vegetation. So we, that's part of our inspections and monitoring plan is to prevent woody um, uh, establishment of trees and and deep rooted vegetation. Kevin, can you hear me? This is Steve Dwyer. Oh, Steve, good. Um, I forgot to mention. Are you done? Okay. Did it? Okay. Beverly still has the floor, Stephen. Go ahead, Beverly. Um, the other question I had is when you uh, submit a plan for closure. Do you have to use a recreational scenario? So the land, the land use it, it over um, a cover. Because I know Rocky Flats is recreational use. Um, and so is that what would happen with all of our MDAs? Like how, what, it's not, obviously not gonna be residential or industrial. I mean, is there any possibility of land use after that? Right. I, what, can, what, can I comment on the previous statement about the roots, or? Steve, yeah, is that so, right? so, I'm sorry. I should okay. have introduced uh, yeah. one of our our co-authors and co-investigators on these MDAs is Steve Dwyer. Who's, oh, Steve uh, Dwyer. Yeah, he's a landfill expert. So I'm happy that he's in the audience and um, to have uh, somebody backing me up on these questions. So if, if it's okay with the, 
It, it, it's Adam perfectly Chair. fine. Thank yep. you. It's good to know. We weren't yep. sure who was, yep. which Steve or Stephen was speaking. So yep. apologies for cutting you off. Um, but and you Beverly, want, we'll, Beverly we'll, did have the floor. We'll follow so. up on your question about um, yeah. land use, but but can we? We'll close the loop on the. Go ahead. The deep rooted vegetation with yes. Steve. Go ahead. Please proceed, Steve. Thank you. Yeah. So so the the previous question was about root intrusion into waste and potential transport of contaminants to the surface and and you know that's a phenomenon that has been experienced it's it's generally they they don't transport much if any but it, if it's a major concern some of the pictures that Kevin showed you were of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal and that site I don't know if you, on the pictures that you saw whether you could see the 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 bottom layer of, of one of the covers had rubbleized concrete, which was concrete that came from the old Stapleton Airport when it was demolished, and we used that as a biointrusion layer. But the area that that con, um, cover was placed over was considered the most contaminated site in the world, and that was where biological and chemical weapons had been produced for decades. And the soils were so contaminated that they couldn't be moved or couldn't be isolated, so we kept them in place, and we wanted to make sure that they were isolated. We didn't want burrowing animals to get to them. We didn't want roots to get to them, so that um, rubbleized concrete served as a biointrusion layer to basically disallow any root intrusion or any type of burrowing, and then the ET cover was built above that. So if, if the contaminants are enough of a concern, you can build into the cover an option to prevent that. Um, so anyway, that's that's just a comment I wanted to make on that. Thank, Thank you, Steve. You. And uh, Steve is available as my backup in, in case I uh, miss a pass or miss a basket. Steve has, has got my back, so. I'm glad to hear that. And I appreciate you being here, Steve, and, and answering that question. Thank you. Beverly, did you? So Beverly, just to follow up on your question, in terms of land use scenarios, um, risk is evaluated for various scenarios, residential, recreational, industrial, construction worker. So that's how we evaluate risk. But in terms of land use, I would imagine all of the MDAs at Los Alamos will be industrial land use for, and, and it, I think Michael would like to make a comment on this. Yes, thank you, I would. Um, <clears throat> land use is, is it would be dictated in, in one of two ways. Uh, <clears throat> the Office of Environmental Management or Cleanup <clears throat> does not specify the end states for the cleanup. Uh, we do that in, in uh, coordination with the landlord because it doesn't make sense to go clean up something to residential standards if the, if the uh, laboratory plans and future needs would put an industrial facility on top of that. So as we perform our work for defining end states, it's in coordination with future land uses and needs by the lab, whether it's gonna be land for turnover, land that's gonna remain in the buffer area that might be uh, recreational or uh, <clears throat> for Native Americans, for example, to go in and harvest natural resources, whatever. The landlord will, will work with us to tell us what that end state is. The second way is the state can dictate something through the RECRA process. So even if the landlord and the Department of Energy in collaboration says, here's what the end state is gonna be. As we put together the remedy, <clears throat> which includes end states, um, the, the state as a regulator has the authority to um, specify that as well. So your specific question can't be answered right now, but it can be answered in the generic way that I just said. And it kind of depends upon the remedy, the level of contamination, the future use, and frankly, what the state will and will not accept. How's that for a, dancing on the head, dancing all over the answer, real answer for you. <laughs> but it's the way it's gonna work. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, please continue. Yep. Okay, so I mentioned at the, the top, we're gonna to discuss what a, a landfill's for and, and how some of these landfills were developed and this next part of the presentation, I'm gonna discuss some research that had 
occurred in Los Alamos specifically at Los Alamos Laboratory and also uh, a, a large scale field experiment that was conducted at Sandia National Laboratory. So these, uh, uh, okay, yeah, so the, the two, two or three areas, so we have investigation and research conducted at Los Alamos, uh, and then at Sandia National Laboratory, and then the third one is the, the airport landfill evapotranspiration cover. So at, during the <clears throat> 1980s, there was investigation about moisture barrier field experiments conducted at Los Alamos. And so this was, was some of the early uh, work looking at how water flows through soils and looking at different soil textures and soil compositions and how to uh, create a barrier. And so there was plots that were, were installed where there was um, sands and gravels overlaid by finer materials and um, and basically what that is doing is it's creating a capillary barrier. So a capillary barrier consists of coarse grain cobbles over a fine grain matrix. So when water is traveling through as a particle through the soil and it hits a big void, it's going to want to stay to its smaller particle. Um, and it's through a process called adhesion of water and cohesion to the particles. But, but basically this phenomena is that you have big particles overlined by fine particles and as the water infiltrates, it's gonna stop when it hits these big particles or gravel layers. So this is a, a schematic just showing what these, these plots consisted of. There's four different experimental plots with cobble layers over on top of a, of a base. They were topped either with gravel or topsoil or just um, bandolier tough fill. And they basically looked at the vertical migration of, of water into through these different cover types. Oh, and then this is also what, what Steve had mentioned too, um, was that there was a lot of research done on on bio barriers. So, so some of these bio barriers are just composition of, of big coarse rocks and um, they can be gravels overlaid by, uh, or cobbles, big rocks overlaid by finer rocks and the uh, crushed tuff. And so basically what this did is it looked at, um, at what was statistically significant for both vegetation intrusion into these layers and also biologic intrusion. And they found that with the, the amount of thickness of these soils, the amount of the size of these materials mattered, but they did find that, that basically these cobble layers were effective in preventing uh, burrowing animals into there as, as well as preventing uh, vertical infiltration of, of water in, through the horizons. So the, the next one, one is a talk about, I'd like to talk about is at Sandia. And uh, so this is Steve Dwyer, he just called in on the phone. He was a principal investigator for the alternative landfill cover demonstration project. And, and basically the goal of that project was to look at all aspects of a landfill cover, including cost, how it was constructed, and the performance data that how each one of these landfill covers um, performed. And the, the goal was is so that they could optimize the cover type so that it meets the regulatory requirements. And it also is, um, is, is less expensive, but still meets the regulatory compliance. So this, uh, this is an aerial photo showing the <clears throat> the plots, the experimental plots. So there was basically six different plots that were, were installed. Uh, two of them were, were traditional RICRA prescriptive plots. 
Um, this one, this subtitle C, is the one that I showed earlier with the thick clay horizon. Uh, this one is uh, just a layer of, of topsoil and uh, compacted soil. And this, this one, the GCL, is a, <clears throat> a geosynthetic clay liner. So this one would have um, a, a geosynthetic clay liner. So that is, consists of two pieces of fabric with a layer of clay between them that is used to, to serve as an impermeable barrier. And then there is also th uh, a capillary barrier that was designed and installed. And the capillary barrier basically consisted of um, sand layers, gravel layers, topsoil layers, um, and then the anisotropic barrier consists of pea gravel, uh, native soil, and fine sand, and pea gravel as well. So just alternating layers of different media for, that would be designed to, to create this capillary barrier. And the last one, um, was this evapotranspiration barrier. And that, that consisted of basically a thin veneer of gravel overlaying topsoil and native soil. So the, these, uh, these plots were studied for several years and the results were, were compiled and published in an EPA document uh, providing technical guidance for these covers. And the, basically the results from those six plots showed that the ET cover and the capillary barrier covers were as good or better than the prescriptive RICRA counterparts. So, so what I was talking about earlier when I showed those, those cross sections, the evapotranspiration cover, which consists of just a soil layer and a gravel layer, performed just as well as the multi-layer RIC recover with the clay horizon, the geomembrane, and the, the different soil horizons. So what we are appealing to you is just the simplicity and the effectiveness. So, so when they were studying this, they, <clears throat> they had uh, the, these plots set up with, they would measure direct precipitation on, on the plots, they measured how much water infiltrated, how much water flowed through the plots and how much water flowed laterally. And they also relied on both natural rainfall and uh, simulated rainfall with, with sprinklers to, to uh, simulate extreme events. And, and overall the findings were is, is basically the, this plot, the evapotranspiration plot performed similar to the, the capillary barrier in, in these two plots. So in terms of cost and ease of implementation and installation, um, really it's, it's the evapotranspiration plot that, that was optimized. Okay, last I'm gonna talk about a specific uh, landfill cover at Los Alamos Landfill Airport. So those of you familiar with Los Alamos County, as you drive up the main hill road and you're passing the airport, to the north or the right side as you're driving up is, is an old uh, Manhattan Project era landfill and that was contained both municipal waste and some laboratory waste from the early Manhattan days project. That landfill is still there um, and, uh, and this was the site of, uh, so yeah, you can see the airport hangars here the airport runway is here. This is the, the landfill cover right here and showing the, the current vegetation of the landfill cover. And, and one of the things to, to point out about this cover is that this, this material that was placed on the surface was a composition of, of topsoil and gravel mix. And the, the topsoil was very supportive of the the native vegetation to, to establish itself. And then as, as the, the top layer matures, this gravel horizon comes to the top and protects, serves as a, a surface protective armor for 
that area. So it's basically gravel armoring the surface. And in between the gravel areas, you have tufts of grass, which act as the transpiration or uptake of the infiltrated water. So this, this slide shows the configuration of the horizons for the airport landfill. So as I mentioned in that other slide there, the top horizon consisted of, of topsoil and rock mixture, which was about six inches thick. Then there was a compacted soil uh, that was a foot and a half thick. And then at the bottom, the bottom horizon is a compact, compacted fine grained soil. And the way we look at this and, and ensure the, the effectiveness of this cover is, is by, we have uh, two stations which measure the soil water content at the depth horizons. And so these, these uh, this is a picture of the data logger which collects the soil moisture and soil suction. We download these data and look at them over time. And and this graph shows that kind of the long-term effectiveness of this evapotranspiration cover. So, so on this x-axis, we have data starting in August of, of 2016 through this last spring, March of 2023. And this uh, y-axis is the moisture content, how wet the soil is. So you can see seasonal, and then each color is uh, a different probe uh, depth. So the, the dark, the black, is the sh most shallow probes at six inches below surface. The red is a foot and a half below surface. Blue is 30 inches below surface. Three feet below surface is green, and the deepest ones is this dark blue. So we'll just look at these, these cycles in the surface, looking at the, the trends of the black horizon, the, the six inch below surface. So you can see that, that this horizon, six inches below the surface, wets and dries. So we'll get rainstorms or, or spring snow melt will wet up, wet up the horizons. But then as the summer progresses, these areas dry out and then they'll wet up again. But what's really the main point of this graph showing over long-term trends is it's a, it's a decreasing trend showing the effectiveness of the vegetation at the surface to basically mine out any water that's in the, in the soil horizon. And even, you know, we speculate, speculate that it's even pulling out water from deeper that had infiltrated past or previously into this, this area. So, so that's, uh, I guess, and then um, backing up to showing this, I mean, the, the other advantages of this is, is this is, these are native plants and native vegetation that's, that's taken hold. Um, and, and the repair on this is, is very easy because it's just soil horizons. If there is an area that eroded, um, it's easy to, to get additional soil or fill material to backfill it and, and maintain it. Whereas some of these other prescriptive remedies with uh, you know, an engineered barrier uh, consisting of a, a geotextile barrier or an, or an impermeable barrier would be much harder to install. So really we're just relying on the soil horizons and the plants to, to up, uptake this water and remove this water from the, from the landfill. So, so Kevin, Kevin this, is, this is Steve again. One, to, to me, one of the, the ET cover, it's, I mean, I'm not there to see the data, but it, it's obviously working well. We, I've, I've read some calculations on, on what the fluxes are showing, and basically it's showing that it's actually pulling, it's a negative flux. You have more water coming out than going in. And, and the reason for that is there was a asphalt, concrete cover placed over it because the airport was wanting to expand their hangars and flaws in the concrete cracks and 
in cracks between the concrete and the asphalt allowed basically 100% of the infiltration for a few years to get into the landfill. And, and that caused significant biodegradation to take off, whereas the, the landfill had been sitting there for 30 years, relatively dormant. The introduction of all that moisture into it reactivated the biodegradation and methane gas quantities took off to the point where it actually exceeded the explosive limits before the removal of the asphalt and concrete. So part of the remedy of that landfill was to remove the prior landfill cover, which was asphalt and concrete, and put this ET cover on. And soon after that was done, the methane levels went to zero and the, and the moisture that, that was in there. So it's, it's more moisture than would typically be at an MDA because of the the coverage of the asphalt and concrete. We're, we're seeing that actually migrate up and out. So those are all positive things. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that, that the, the methane, uh, being able to release that through the, uh, the soils was a big, was a big deal. Yeah, th thanks Steve for that clarification. And I did want to talk about the asphalt as well, because people have asked me, well, why don't we just put pavement over it? And as, as Steve mentioned, we all think of pavement as being impervious, but what happens to asphalt at, at, soon after it's laid down is it develops cracks. And I don't think anybody's driven on a road not going over a bunch of cracks in the asphalt. So, so you'll, once you get a crack in the asphalt, then that acts as an infiltration. And so the water will, will pool and, and flow into that crack and infiltrate below the asphalt. And then it, the, it, it's easy to infiltrate, but it's hard to evaporate out of asphalt because the asphalt is, is impermeable except for in the cracks. And a crack aperture only allows a little bit of water to evaporate out of it but the net in infiltration into asphalt is, is very high and the net evaporation is very low. So it creates higher moisture. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that you would think uh, an asphalt would be impervious and, and not allow infiltration, but, but once it develops cracks, then it enhances infiltration and it enhances uh, collection of, of water. Kevin, Stephen, this is Elena. Um, quickly. So the asphalt also, not only is it increasing the moisture in the cover, it's also introducing petroleum products into, into the cover as well, into the ground. Is that, is that, has it been an issue? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. there's uh, the asphalt's composed of, of you know. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, chemicals. And, yeah. But I don't think the, the migration is... I mean, significant. It, yeah, okay. I think it's uh, isolated to a uh, near surface. So it's better not to have the asphalt clearly, but also it's not. It hasn't caused too much infiltration and significant infiltration and of, of the petroleum. Yeah, I mean the the asphalt does not prevent in, infiltration, or, or you know, it, it doesn't act as an impermeable barrier. And then there, at, Sure, there's got to be residual compounds that right. that are leached from asphalt as well. But okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, just uh, in conclusion for the airport landfill, it is, this is the eighth year of monitoring and installation at the airport landfill. It's been very successful, and uh, we were performing quarterly inspections on the landfill and, and we just have uh, requested with the <clears throat> New Mexico Environment Department to reduce that to semi-annual and, and event-based inspections. And they approved that reduction because basically our, uh, the, the landfill cover is performing as designed and two specifications. So we're pr proposing to do uh, semi-annual inspections, once in the spring and once in the fall, and then of course, following any big rainstorms that we would get in the summer rainy season. So the, the vegetation cover is, is fully established, as you saw of photos, and our, our moisture monitoring indicates long-term drying trends at the site. And we just don't really see significant erosion um, occurring at that landfill cover either. 
So, um, and then as, as Steve mentioned, the methane gas, there was previously a problem with methane generation at that landfill due to excessive infiltration of water and decomposition of the, the materials in the landfill, which led to methane gas. And that's, we measure that um, on an annual basis and we have never seen any detectable methane concentrations since we've installed the, the evapotranspiration cover. So one other thing just to point out of why, why these evapotranspiration covers are so effective in the semi-arid environment is that the, in our environment, um, this, this graph shows the monthly annual or the monthly precipitation, the average monthly precipitation for Los Alamos. So this, the red bars would be how much precipitation occurs on a monthly basis. So during the winter months, we get about an inch a month of precipitation. And then during our summer months is when we get most of our rainfall. And that's in July, August, and September in our, our uh, monsoonal type rainstorms. And we'll get about three inches on average in July, August, and uh, around two inches on average in September. So that's our precipitation. And then the amount of evaporation or potential evaporation is on these blue bars. So on a monthly basis, we have um, about twi twice as much or more evapotranspiration as we do precipitation. So this p potential for ev evapotranspiration is, is based on uh, temperature, you know, higher temperatures, increased evaporation, the amount of humidity, drier conditions will uh, also increase more evaporation, and the amount of sunlight that we get in the uh, Los Alamos area, and also wind. So when it's sunny and windy and hot, then you get much more evaporation. And on an annual basis, that total is, is far more than the amount of precipitation we get which also explains this, this, this trend where we see a decrease in uh, moisture contents in the evapotranspiration cover. Okay. All right, so just in conclusion about the evapotranspiration covers, they're very well suited for dry climates, as we mentioned. Um, they're, they're easy to construct it just relies on soil and gravel and native vegetation. The gravel provides stability and erosion control. And the, the soil horizons will promote <clears throat> native vegetation. And because it is a native system that is, is accustomed to our climate, it's, it's very long lasting and um, durable over long time periods. And last, you know, there's these, those, these uh, cover types have been used throughout the West and throughout the United States with, with a, a very high degree of success. So in closing, uh, there's barely been a lot of research that has been conducted for cover designs. And the cover designs are all designed to isolate the waste. So we don't want water infiltrating into the waste and going deeper, transporting contamination. We want the water to stay at the surface of the, our soil horizon, and then we want the water to evaporate. And particularly in the Southwest environment, the evapotranspiration covers are really optimal and very highly effective. So this last slide in your packet um, just has a reference for additional resources. Uh, I looked up some of these, these guides for, they provide more information about caps or evapotranspiration covers. And they're basically just two page uh, fact sheets for each one of these uh, products or uh, types of, of remedies. So thank you for, 
staying awake and paying attention. And uh, I'll, I'll thank the coffee and cake more so than, than anything for, for keeping everyone tuned in. We appreciate it. <clears throat> thank so, you very much, Kevin. And thank you, Steve, for helping, for pitch hitting, pinch hitting, how does that, how do you say that? For assisting, pinch, pinch hitting for us. Uh, do any of our members have any questions or comments about ET covers, evapotranspiration? Manny? I guess, uh, how does your long-term drying trend reflect on or um, correspond to the long-term drought we've been ex experiencing? Right. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if all of us in northern New Mexico have really experienced this this drought that we've seen, particularly in the last 20 years, you know, where it's unusual to see native trees, pinions dying off. And, mm. uh, but there's other trees that hang in there. The junipers, they'll, they'll hang in there throughout the, the time. And when we look at this time series uh, plot of the moisture, it only goes back to, you know, it's just seven years long, but, but certainly, there is periods of drier than average precipitation in this period. And there's also periods that are a little bit wetter. So you can see these spikes that, you know, the, these horizons will dry up and then they'll wet up and then they'll dry up and they'll, they'll um, so, so that's just seasonal cycles of, but I guess in terms to, to answer your question though, the, the long-term drying helps with preventing moisture from infiltrating into the waste and helps protect the waste from from further infiltration and migration. So basically your trend mirrors the drought effects. And... That's a, I mean, it'd be hard to, to pull the conclusion like that from just one plot, but, but the location of this, these uh, monitors are on the Mesa. You know, it's, it's, it's a typically, it's, it's a drier environment where we don't get runoff coming from upland areas into this area. It's just an isolated mesa. So, so over time, it's just, it's a very dry environment. And, and which is also where a lot of the MDA locations are, is on mesa tops towards the edge of the, of the Potrito Plateau, where it is typically much drier than it is up higher in elevation, closer to the mountains. Okay. And, and you Kevin, would, you, would you mind if I would, would it be all right if I commented on that? Yes, please uh, do. So the, the the question was about the long term drying trends, and and that's all. It's obvious with the the water balance data. It, it corresponds with the the drought conditions. But to me, the, the there is a, a a myriad of performance objectives dependent on the site that you need to consider for the, the design of these systems and for a lot of the ET cover sites, especially the longer term ones that have radioactive waste, like some of your UMTRA sites and some of your RAD sites in Los Alamos and a lot of other sites I've worked on, the, the easy one to fix is the water balance because, I mean, the, when you've got a site like Los Alamos or drier sites where you've got a significantly more climatic demand for water than you have a supply of water and precipitation. It's pretty easy to to satisfy the water balance. The, the tougher one is if you go into a prolonged drought where you're worried about erosion, you're worried about vegetation die off, and you're worried about rills and gullies cutting in through the cover into the underlying waste. To me, that was that's the tougher part of the design. And, the landfill that Kevin was talking about at the airport, we, we addressed that a little bit with, with the addition of the gravel in the surface soil. We addressed it more so in other sites where it's a bigger concern, but basically what we've done is we've incorporated what we call a desert pavement into the surface of these ET covers that disallows the uh, the formation of rills and gullies by by adding rock. So basically, when you, whenever you're optimizing the topography of these things, you're, you're taking into account slope and slope length, and and typically that's all most people take into account is slope and slope length. And you want to keep 
the velocities of the flow low enough to not erode and not carry soil water away. But for longer term droughts, that, that's a little tougher to do. So what we've d done is we've added another variable. We've, we've added rock, which increases the particle size, which increases the resistance to soil loss and real and gully formation. So if, for instance, you go through the drought of all droughts where all of your vegetation dies off, the cover's still going to work because it, we've, we've incorporated rock into it to anticipate that, I guess. So as it gets drier, obviously your water balance is less of a concern, but your erosion is more of a concern. So I guess my point is, is that whether it gets wetter or gets drier, all those are taken into account in the design to come up with the optimum cover profile for the specific site that you're, uh, you're concerned with. So anyway, my two cents. Thank you, Steve. Marty, I think you have some a follow-up. Yeah, so another question then is the, um, this evapotranspiration uh, process that you described, are you monitoring off-target movement of contaminated material in upward movement, as well as uh, the potential for it to go down through the fractures in the tuff? Well, in this case, our, our cover type prevents any infiltration into the, the waste, so it's just going to be rainfall, which is uncontaminated, falling on our cover, which is also uncontaminated. So there's not really a, uh, a pathway of contamination because it's being restricted to this upper horizon. So that evapotranspiration is just strictly surface movement? Yeah. Um, Yeah, so, so this, you know, we're, the evapotranspiration is, is really confined to this, this area, you know, the upper horizon where you'll have rainfall will infiltrate and then the sun and wind and, and heat will evaporate it and then the plants will, through roots, will uptake it. So it's, it's really, it, this is where most of the activity occurs is in this upper horizon. Soil horizon. This chart here, yep. how would you explain that then? So that uh, chart, that shows that our monthly totals of precipitation and evaporation. So basically what this, this shows is, um, we'll just pick, uh, so where are we? We're at February, right? Or January still. So in January, on average, there's about an inch of, of rainfall or snow uh, in this case. But the temperature, wind, humidity, and, and heat generates two and a half inches of evaporation uh, or transpiration. So, so on this plot, it's just saying that every month of the year, we have more potential or more opportunity for evaporation and transpiration than we do of precipitation. I guess that's ex exactly what I was getting at. Where does that come from? The evaporation? Well, where, where, where does that come from? Everything that's going to evaporate in oh. addition to the oh. surface water. Sure. Okay. So, so this is its potential. Um, so you, you evaporate to a certain level but then, and then that's when the vegetation basically goes dormant and it can't, you know, it kind of like hides out. And, and even though you have more evaporation than, than precipitation that's available, it's, it's, it's a net uh, deficit. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it very well. I, I, Steve, do you understand? Can you answer Marty's question? I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Or are you, are you, are you what, what, how can we Maybe I, I just need to uh, educate myself a little more, maybe. Oh, no. Uh, so I think the, the question is, is, is how, how does evapotranspiration always exceed precipitation? Well, you described this as coming up as, as from the ground. 
So that material, that water or moisture is moving through that waste layer to get to the surface. So um, how does that reflect it in, in the movement of contaminated material to the surface? Yeah, so I think, I think it's, it's actually, it's not interacting with, uh, let me go back to this first plot. So the, the basically the evapotranspiration processes are only usually happening in the top three or four feet of soil. Below that, you're, you're typically close to steady state conditions where moisture is really not moving unless it's really being sucked up. But the evaporate, what you're wanting to do is prevent rainwater from getting through the cap into the waste to add to any moisture that's there that could potentially move waste that's there. You're, you're not, waste that's deep, say 30 feet deep, 40 feet deep, or, whatever, or I mean moisture, uh, the, the climate's not gonna pull that out. That's, the climate's generally only pulling the soil moisture out that's down about three or four feet. Does, it, does that help answer your question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so Marty, where we're, we're really, where the really dynamic and, and infiltration and evaporation horizons are occurring is, is in this top 18 inches of soil or, or at most three feet. You know, you have the water will, it'll, rainfall will come and infiltrate, but then it'll be taken back up and, and released back into the atmosphere. So I think, and maybe I'm, I'm jumping to a conclusion, but, but maybe what it, the next question I think you might ask is like, is how do we ever get groundwater if, if water is, is continually being evaporated out of, if we don't have enough rainfall and we have too much evaporation? And the way we get groundwater is we have a big basin that captures water and it flows down into the canyons and into the alluvium and you get concentrations of, of runoff and streams and then that percolates deeper into the horizons, into different layers and fractures, and goes and recharges the aquifer. But we don't really get recharge of the aquifer on the mesa tops because, because of this phenomena of so much evaporation versus so little precipitation. So to overcome that, you have to have a bigger basin and a bigger scale, and you get water that runs off down into the basin, into the canyon bottoms, and then, then you have sustained flow, and that recharges the aquifer. We, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. Great, thank you. Manny, was that, you're good? All right, thank you, Stephen, thank you, Kevin. We have time for one more question from Mark, and then we'll move on with the agenda. Mark, one question, please. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. The question is, it seems to me like with a mesh network of, of roots, you'd want to have some bigger plants, maybe juniper size, but I hadn't seen any in the pictures. Any comment? Yeah, as, as we talked about earlier, the, the woody vegetation is a lot of times deep, more deep-rooted, and so you really want your roots to be confined to these upper horizons, the upper three feet or so, of, and because that's where most of the cycling of the, the moisture is occurring. And also, as Steve mentioned too, in, in a response to another question was, even though there are roots that can go deep into the waste, the, the uptake is, is very minor in terms of a, a percentage or a fraction of the total water balance volume. Great, thank you. Mark, was that, are you? Okay, great, thank you. And um, as a reminder, <clears throat> the risk of evaluation and, and um, man, excuse me, my voice is failing. <clears throat> REM subcommittee did select um, an enhanced measure for the, for materials disposal area H, and we recommended the evapotranspiration cover after after much consideration of the other covers. So, and I appreciate your work because that was also helpful in us making a determination for that. So, thank you. Good, thank you. All right. Round of applause. Thank you, Kevin, and thank, thank you, Steve. 
We, members, um, in your packet you have the meeting schedule for 2024 and then the work plan, the final work plan uh, headquarters would like us to, to work on for this year for 2024. So note that the next meeting will be on February 21st. That's a combined subcommittee and uh, Keith will give an update on that later or you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Sure. Please. Yeah, I have a few dates that uh, Bridget, the, uh, make sure we get this right this time. The executive director wants me to make sure I let you all know about. All right, on uh, February 21st, we do have a combined subcommittee meeting uh, from 1 to 3 uh, to hear from the budget, uh, budget presentation in February. So we'll be doing that and discuss the CAB priorities. The next full CAB that we're doing like here every bi-monthly will be on March 20th, and that'll be at the City of Gold Hotel Tribal Room. Um, uh, just a reminder, too, we do have the spring chair meeting hosted uh, by the Portsmouth cab in Ohio, and that's April 30th uh, through May 2nd. And if you're interested in going to that, uh, please let uh, Bridget and Manise know. And um, if you're interested in attending that. And then we uh, addressed this a little bit earlier, Mark's comment on the WIP tour, and uh, we are planning to get something in place uh, for October, but more to come on that one. So I'm sure we'll send those dates out to everybody too, but I wanted to go through that. That's all I have. Thank you, Keith. And if you haven't attended a, a chair's meeting before, I highly recommend that uh, you go. Um, since some of you haven't gone yet, so please put your name in if you're available and, and travel. See what our other sites are doing. Let's look at the work plan. This is the final work plan. Um, this is what DOE headquarters EM would like us to focus on because they're they're requesting our advice and recommendations on these items and uh, the work plan for number one would be chromium interim measures status and outlook. So that one, um, the recommendation, you'll notice that there are also recommendation deadlines um, or at soonest opportunity. So these are things that DOE would like us to focus on and was there another comment on this is the work plan, and um, this is different from how we've done it in the past. Yeah. Our subcommittees will focus on, on these work plans. Mark, you have a comment? Yes, Madam Chair. I understand from Michael's comments earlier that work plan item number five may not be applicable. Is that true or not? <clears throat> I'm sorry. When... If I can interject, <clears throat> work plan, I was reacting to a, the work plan that we submitted to the state as part of a Appendix B thing. I misunderstood. It was, you were referring to this work plan. Y yes, I was. Okay, no, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the context of my response was a little bit different. I apologize for that. I was thinking in terms of the work plan that we submitted to the state as part of uh, Appendix uh, B for the consent order and how we were working the the uh, chromium interim measure and, and the characterization and so forth. I, I you, everything I said is correct except I wouldn't. My comments about it being OBE in your work plan. No, if it's something that we want <clears throat> the cab or the cab wants to go in and look at it, comment upon, that's not necessarily OBE. It'll, it'll be a context, though, we take the feedback depending upon where we are with working uh, with the state on the expert technical review. But I, I didn't, I, I got work plans mixed up in my head. I apologize. And as a follow up, I, I noticed that the uh, briefing discussion dates may include a February 2024. Is that the plan or is it for some time else in the year? Are you referring to the budget discussion on February? The Work plan item number two? No, work plan item five says in briefing discussion dates, April 2024 at CAB combined subcommittee meeting could alternatively do so in February 2024. So is 2024 anticipated for the briefing? For the briefing? Yeah, it's the second block on work plan item number five, briefing slash discussion dates. 
and one of them is February 2024, and I just wondered if that was the plan. No, in, in February we are doing uh, the budget briefing discussion on for this, the combined subcommittee meeting. Work plan. work plan number two. We will not be looking at work plan number five as the alternative for the February meeting. And also on our work plan item number three, it says February 2024 as well. Is that planned? Uh, again, we'll be focusing on the budget and the combined subcommittee meeting on February 2024. So not item three or five? There are tentative dates. Um, so we, will, we want to focus just on the budget, the briefing, prioritization for the February, for work plan item number two in February for our subcommittee meeting. These others are just alternates and tentative dates, so they are adaptable, they are movable, but for now, I think uh, February is set for work plan number two. All right, so there'll be a revision and we'll know what those dates are. There will be a revision to items number, work items three and five, and you will let us know? If there is a revision, yes. We, we, you will be informed. We will all be informed, yes. Okay, it says February. I guess we have to revise it. We will be focusing on the budget in February. Any other comments from members? None. Marty, do you have anything you'd like to say? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I haven't heard from you. Uh, thanks, Elena. No, I'm, I'm fine. I've been listening and I don't have any additional comments to add to anything anyone has said. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, we, if you have a comment in the chat, please submit those to Bridget via email. I know Scott Kovac will also be submitting his public comment to Bridget. Um, Jose. Madam Chair, I just want to say something to Michael. Michael, since I came on board, the perception in my community, that includes me too, was always that for some reason, the people that live in Los Alamos, anybody that worked in Los Alamos was paranormal, normal. Something was not there. They didn't, uh, the, the perception was no heart. It's like the 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 the, uh, the Tin Man, my heart, my heart, right? Los Alamos did not have a heart, but today you show the heart, and that's what you need to carry with you when you go to your new your new job. Carry the heart, stay focused, be firm, stand your ground, and you're gonna be okay. And so, said that, you have purpose. You achieved your purpose while you were here. You did what you did, what you had to do. You made it work. Now take that purpose with you, with a heart. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, Jose. And um, again, if you have any comments or any other things you'd like to submit, please submit those to Bridget. and. Uh, I couldn't say it any better myself, Jose. And uh, Michael leaves a big heart with us, and our heart goes with you. And we appreciate you, and we appreciate what you've done to help us with building our community, which we are working so hard to do. And it, it is we are grateful that you were able to add to that, and um, we're better for it, I'll all leave of you, us. I'll leave you with one last thought. The cake was amazing, but I have a question. And it's something I've learned here. Where was the Christmas sauces to the side? I, I was expecting a red or green chili sauce to go on the chocolate and the cake. <laughs> I'm sorry. There are some restaurants we can throw on. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all, and I appreciate all your time and your effort and your your listening and your presentations and your comments. And um, again, we come together, all of us, the board, the public the Environment Department, N3B, EMLA um, headquarters. 
and our wonderful, exceptional staff. And we will, as we change and grow, um, we've learned a lot from Manise and we are so grateful to her. And all of us together, we're trying to build the public trust together and we're also trying to help the public um, for what they need and what they want. And I am grateful to all of you for your efforts. And with that, Keith, take us out. All right. Uh, well, yeah, with that, we're going to adjourn the Northern New Mexico uh, Citizens Advisory Board today. Oh, I get this. <laughs>